Scary Terry strikes again. A second homicide has taken place in 13 C Elm Street. 44-year-old Linda Hayden was found murdered in her sleep this afternoon. Her throat had been slit with a sharp weapon, and she died choking on her own blood. She lived with her 15-year-old daughter, Samantha, who discovered her mother's bloody dead body in her bedroom this morning. Cops have been called to the crime scene, and our reporter managed to talk to the poor daughter a few minutes ago. Let's take a look at what Samantha Hayden had to say. Mom was never an early riser, but when she didn't come downstairs for lunch, I, I got a little worried. So I went to her room to check on her. I knocked twice, but she didn't answer, so, so I opened the door and I saw... Oh my god! I saw... Her neck was cut open, and there was blood everywhere, on the bedsheet, the curtains, and and the walls. <laughs> Did you see any more escape? No. The room was empty, but there was something written on the wall with her blood. What was it? You had it coming, witch. Yours, Scary Terry. He wrote this with my mother's blood. I don't know what to do. I can't sleep in that house tonight. Do you believe it's Scary Terry? Of course it's him. He's crazy. Someone, please stop him before he kills again. We can only imagine what horror young Samantha is going through right now. The sheriff went to the house on Elm Street, and cops are questioning every neighbor about the psycho murderer who calls himself Scary Terry. His first victim was 45-year-old Ronald Regan from the same neighborhood who he killed the same way two days ago. But who is Scary Terry? He was just a fictional character from the popular sitcom Rick and Morty, but now he appears to be real, as real as a nightmare. Is it the doing of some deranged lunatic, or is it some kind of ugly revenge from a man who both Mr. Regan and Mrs. Hayden knew? These answers are yet unknown, but what seems to be scarier is the question, is he done yet, or are there more names on his hit list? Dude, what the hell is happening in our town? I looked at Liam. His face turned pale, too. In the last week, some nutjob killer has struck our neighborhood. He is sneaking into people's houses and slitting their throats in their sleep. My brother and I were watching the morning news when we heard my dad walk in front of the main door. My dad is the town sheriff. Dad, did you find out who this Scary Terry is? I have no freaking idea, kiddo. Poor Ronald and Linda. Can't believe they are dead. We all went to high school together, and now they have been murdered by some psycho killer. God. My dad sat down at the table, burying his worried face into his palm. He took a deep breath and said, I'll be going out tonight. The cops will be uh, patrolling the entire neighborhood, so keep all the doors and windows locked until I come back. Understood? Yes, Dad. Man, I need to get some sleep. If anyone calls for me, tell them I will be at the station by five. Okay? Seeing my dad all tensed and tired, I could sense the gravity of the situation. He went to his room for a much-needed nap, and I sat beside Liam. Do you really think this scary Terry took revenge on them? I don't know. Mr. Reagan and Miss Hayden were nice people. Why would anyone hold a grudge against them? Maybe they wronged this Scary Terry really bad. Hey, didn't Dad say they all went to high school together? Yeah, so? So, he has to be someone Ronald and Linda both knew, just like the news lady said. So you're saying Scary Terry also went to high school with them? Exactly. I rushed to the basement and brought out my dad's yearbook. Liam and I were going through the old pictures when suddenly the lights went out and we heard a loud thud upstairs. What? What is that? I looked at Liam with fearful eyes. He slowly got up from the couch and called out, Dad, are you all right? But our dad didn't reply. A cold shiver ran down my spine, and I began hearing footsteps above us. Someone's inside our house. Is it? Is it Scary Terry? Liam walked to the kitchen and grabbed a knife. We both tiptoed to our dad's room. Dad... Dad, is everything... But as I pushed the door open, I saw a horrifying scene. My dad was tied to a chair, and a man, dressed like Scary Terry, was standing behind him, holding a miniature sword by his neck. He looked right into my eyes and said, Welcome to your dad's nightmare, boys. <laughs> dad, 
What's going on? Don't come in. Stay there. Why are you hurting him? I'm hurting him? I am hurting him? He and his selfish friends hurt my brother. They bullied him and tortured him so bad that my poor brother lost his mind. He became suicidal, and one night, he set his room on fire. He and my entire family burned down to ashes. If I hadn't been rescued on time, I would have died too. Saying this, he took off his cowboy hat, and finally, I saw his entire face. His face was burnt. His skin was sagging under his chin, making him look worse than a corpse. Liam said in a fumbling voice, Please, please don't hurt our dad. He had it coming. He had it coming, just like Ronald and Linda. Now, the world will know the town sheriff and his friends are the actual reason Scary Terry came to life. He slipped my dad's throat in one swift motion, and he saw our dad's eyes turn bloodshot. The veins in his forehead popped out in pain, and a choking gurgle came out of his mouth. His legs began shaking like a dying bird, and I screamed the loudest scream of my life. No! Dad! But Scary Terry didn't just stop there. He then held the same miniature sword to his own throat and said, I hope you boys learn from your father's mistakes. Don't ever bully someone, or they might come back to take their revenge. I would have ended my life long ago, but then one day, I saw Scary Terry in Rick and Morty. For the first time in my life, I felt like I could relate to someone. Do you know what it's like to grow up without a family? To see a burnt face every day in the mirror and recall that it was your own brother who was responsible for it? But then I realized I shouldn't blame him. If anyone is responsible for ruining my life, it was your father and his evil friends. I had my revenge now. I can die in peace now. See you in hell, bitches! Once again, the Scary Terry murders ended on a sad note. The sheriff is now the third victim of this psycho killer, and he himself remains the fourth victim of himself. The town is shaking in fear, but also hoping to sleep tonight with this assurance that Scary Terry is finally dead. My name is Eileen. You may not know me, but if you surf the internet enough, chances are you know my daughter. She became popular for making a lot of videos where she got mad about things. All of these videos are acted out. Nothing my daughter says is real, except for one video, the most popular one on her channel, where she says she hates minions. Every time she sees them, she has a fit of rage or just cries. When she was a kid, she used to love them. But a few years ago, something happened. An experience that would change our lives forever. And in this story, we will tell you about it. It all started on a normal day. I had to go downtown to do some business. My daughter, whom I will call Anna, had no classes, so I had to take her with me. Anna was a very restless girl. One of those kids that you can't neglect for a moment, because if they see something that catches their attention, they will go and take a closer look. And that's exactly what happened. On the way to the post office, we both met a man dressed as a minion. To Anna, this seemed completely natural and even funny, but to me, it gave me a very bad vibe. The man did not have a conventional minion costume, but rather the costume was attached to his body it was like a human minion that looked like something out of a child's nightmare. I was terrified. When the minion saw us, he raised his hand and greeted us. Mom! Mom! May I say hello? Please, Mom! No, Anna. Remember what I always tell you. You must not talk to strangers. But he's not a stranger. He's a minion, just like in the movie. I know, honey, but there are a lot of minions. Not all of them are good. Stay away from him. Okay, Mom. I went into the mail room with Anna, thinking she had learned her lesson. I took out the documents I had to send, and as I looked at my turn in line, I looked around and, terrified, noticed that my daughter was not by my side. I came out of the mail room, desperate, and saw her a few feet away. The minion was standing next to her, saying something in her ear. Anna was perplexed, her eyes wide, surprised and terrified. 
I ran to her and pulled her away. Anna burst into tears as I had never seen her cry before. What did you say to my daughter, you psycho? In response, the minion raised his hand and waved at me. I grabbed him by the suit and shook him violently, but all my fury turned to fear as I made a discovery. Behind the minion's glasses, I could see one of the eyes of the person wearing the suit. I couldn't see the right eye, but the left eye was tinged with blood red. The eye was open, full of veins, staring nervously at me. I let go of the man, grabbed my daughter, and without finishing my business at the post office, we headed for home. As I was leaving, I turned around and behind me, the minion was waving at us. Baby, I told you not to go near that minion. You should always listen to mom. Anna didn't answer me. She just looked ahead, terrified. Oh God, Anna, what did that scary man say to you? Again, she didn't answer me. But this time, she started crying and hugged me. Oh, my baby, that man won't do anything to you. You're with mommy. Suddenly, Anna quickly pulled away from me and walked backward, scared. Mommy! Mommy! The minion! He's behind you! Incredulous, I turned around. Behind me, half a block away, the man in the minion costume was standing on the sidewalk, waving at us from a distance. Oh God, Anna, we have to go. I grabbed her hand and walked very fast. I took several detours to lose him and even got on a bus. Every time I thought I had lost him, he was there, standing there, waving at us. This was no accident. This man was following us and he made no effort to hide it. When we arrived at our apartment, I locked the door to the building and went to our room on the second floor. I opened the windows and looked out. The man was downstairs, looking at me with his eyes. When he saw me, he looked at me and greeted me. Even though he now knew where I lived, there was nothing he could do to reach me before I called the police. I stepped away from the window and dialed the number. The 911 operator was surprised by what I told her, but she believed me and told me she would notify the nearest patrol cars. Ah! Anna's scream scared me. I looked in her direction and saw that she was pointing at the window. I looked in her direction and from the shock, I dropped the phone, which broke on the spot. The minion was in front of us. Did he climb two floors of a building on his own, not caring that people were watching him? Where did he get this strength? Before our bewildered gaze, the minion finished climbing and climbed into the house. Standing in front of the window, he raised his hand and greeted us. What the hell do you want? I already called the police. Get away from us! Without paying attention to me, the man took off his minion mask, and behind it, we met the worst. His skin was yellow, painted like a minion, but something was very wrong. Where his right eye should have been, there was a huge gap. Had he removed his eye to look more like a minion? His mouth also had a problem. His lips and mouth were cut off, so his smile was much more sinister and bigger than normal. As the minion began to greet us, I quickly went to a compartment in the kitchen and pulled out a revolver I had stored to defend myself. I shot him three times in the chest, and the man went down. But my relief was short-lived, because a few seconds later, he stood up as if nothing had happened. No! This is impossible! Terrified, I dropped the gun and ran to the exit door. I tried to put the keys in the door, but it was too late. The minion was glued to me. I fell to the floor in fear, and he crouched down and came even closer. I was up against the wall, face to face with his terrifying person. Do you wanna be my friend? Mom, no! Before I could process what was happening, I saw Anna, in desperation, smash a plate over the minion's head. This seemed to hurt him, and he backed away, to which Anna began to kick him angrily. The man recovered and lunged at her, but I managed to grab her, put the key in the door, and lock him inside the apartment. I stood there, waiting for the police to come. When they arrived a few minutes later, I assumed the man was gone. 
I kept an eye on the keyhole to see if anyone was there. Oh my god! He's still there! I gave the keys to the police, who came in and arrested the man. Soon after, I found out that this man had no identity, no police records, no nothing. He was like a ghost. The only thing that put my mind at ease was to confirm that he was human, since the cops told me that my shots did not kill him because he was wearing a bulletproof vest. I could never be calm again after that day. But poor Anna got the worst of it. The trauma was so great that from that day on, every time she sees a minion, she goes crazy and rushes at it, attacking it as if her life depended on it. When I woke up, I was in a hospital room, lying on a stretcher with the light on next to me. It took me a few minutes to understand what was happening or realize it, since I didn't really know why I was in this place. Hello? What I knew was that I was going back to my house, and suddenly I woke up there. But I didn't feel bad. My body was in perfect condition. Hello? I need help! Even though I kept calling, no one answered me. In fact, it was too quiet for a hospital, but that wasn't the strangest thing. At first glance, everything seemed normal, but if you looked closely, you could see that the walls had dirt stains. After a while, I also noticed another detail. Instead of smelling like disinfectant and medicine, the stench reaching my nostrils was a combination of moisture and metal. Without waiting any longer, I easily got up from the stretcher and walked towards the exit door. But before I could reach it, someone opened it. Tony? It was my brother. Hey, what are you doing? You need to rest. He walked over to me and pushed me back onto the stretcher as I watched him. It really was Tony. But I don't feel bad. What happened? My brother forced me to lie down. You had an accident. You should stay in bed even if you don't feel bad. That's what they told me. Tony kept smiling as he spoke. Who? What? Who said that to you? The nurses, of course. Where are they? I've been calling a lot of times and no one came. They're busy with the other patients, but don't worry, they'll come to check on you soon. The smile on Tony's face got a lot bigger. Meanwhile, I looked away and tried to get up again, but he put his hand on my chest and pushed me away. I told you not to worry. I'll be with you as long as necessary. That's not... <sighs> you should rest too. You don't have to do this. Why? I'm happy to help my brother. For some reason, I was getting more and more nervous. This isn't like you. I pushed him away and quickly got up and walked back to the door. That room was starting to suffocate me, as if I were claustrophobic. Finally, I moved the door handle, but before I could open it fully, he grabbed my wrist. You have to stay. Stop it, Tony. Let go of me. You have to stay to watch him. To watch him, I thought. You have to watch him die again, over and over again, until you can't take it anymore. Suddenly, right on my brother's head, a bruise began to form, and it didn't stop growing. What? Slowly, it got darker and darker, until I noticed the wound was beginning to open through a scratch. Tony, what's going on? Brother... A lump formed in my throat the instant the scratch turned into a deep gash that split his head in two. You have to watch it again. But even so, Tony kept a smile while speaking normally. You have to stay here. No! I soon pulled my arm towards me, causing him to release it. As you want. Meanwhile, I stood frozen like a statue. <laughs> By the time I reacted, half of its body had already formed, so without waiting any longer, I opened the door and closed it behind me. Shit! Soon, I began to run down the hospital corridor. The lights illuminated it perfectly. In fact, it was so shiny that it seemed like it was being cleaned every five minutes, but the smell of moisture and metal was becoming more noticeable. I'd been in hospitals before, so I knew I'd reach the entrance at some point, but it seemed like the hallway would never end. 
Even though I kept running until my legs started to hurt and I was hyperventilating, there was no end. Inevitably, I stopped and leaned against a wall to rest. Help! Please! I didn't wait for someone to come out of the rooms. I just randomly picked one and walked towards it. Fred! There, at the beginning or end of the corridor, was that thing. Do you want to get out of here, Fred? There's only two ways. Quickly, I opened the door and closed it behind me. The room was lit, as was everything else, but the stench of metal was more noticeable here. Hello? I slowly approached the curtain that prevented me from seeing the stretcher and removed it. Shit! The stretcher was covered in blood as the person's stomach appeared to have exploded. Fred! It looked like that thing was right behind the door. Shit! Shit! Without many options, I entered through the other door that was in the room. I thought it would be a bathroom or a closet where I would be cornered, but it actually connected to another hallway. What? <laughs> Fred! As soon as I heard that thing banging on the door behind me, I quickly backed away. I... I, I can't... I was starting to collapse when I saw my salvation. This time, the corridor had an end where there were stairs. I ran towards them, and just as I started to go down, I heard it again. Fred! Fuck you! Suddenly, I heard a strange sound and felt my foot hit something. It was water. No. I couldn't get to the bottom floor, as it was completely flooded. No, no, no! Fred! I didn't have to turn around to know that that thing was there. Suddenly, I felt something pressing on my skin. <laughs> the entity was passing through my body, and even if it seemed like smoke, it hurt more than anything else in the world. I've got you! I thought I was going to pass out when I closed my eyes, but instead, I opened them. I was back in a hospital room. Everything was dark, but it seemed quite normal. The real problem was that that was all I could do. Watch. My body was not responding to my orders. I wanted to move. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't. Suddenly, I saw a shadow move in the doorway. I immediately started to feel my heart beating fast and sweat covering my skin. Not again, I thought. This time, I couldn't escape. The entity began to climb on top of me until its face was right in front of mine. At that moment, I could see again its creepy smile formed by huge and pointed teeth. Fred, I told you there were only two ways out. <laughs> This is not one of them! That thing opened its mouth and continued to approach me. Then, finally... Ah! Almost immediately, someone walked in. Are you okay? The nurse didn't wait for my answer. Instead, she turned her head to the right and yelled. He woke up! I later found out that after my brother and I were in a car accident, he died, and I was in a coma for several days. In fact, I soon remembered how I had seen him die. It's been a while and I've been able to recover from the trauma, but I still feel that something is haunting me. Last Thanksgiving, Nina asked me to have dinner with her family at their ranch house. I was pretty serious about her, so I said, why not? We set out on this beautiful mountain road surrounded by the vast landscape and deep woods. While adjusting her prosthetic ear, Nina said that her parents and grandpa were dying to meet me. After driving for almost three hours, we took a turn into this narrow, dusty road and stopped in front of a beautiful house. The house had this domestic architectural style which looked pretty new to me. I honked the car horn and a man in his late 50s came out with a walking stick in his hand. 
He was limping slightly on the left foot. Our eyes met and he gave me a cold stare for noticing his walk. Nina ran to hug him. Hi, Dad. I missed you. He hugged her back and then said to me, You must be Justin. Yes, sir. Thanks for inviting me. Call me Arnold. Saying this, he let out a creepy grin and took us inside the house. The house was huge and filled with antiques. There was a high back red chair near the fireplace, and an old man wearing black sunglasses was sitting on it. Upon entering, he greeted us, saying, There's our Barbie and her Ken doll, I guess. Oh, stop it, Grandpa. Nina blushed, but I walked up to him and shook his hand. At first, I thought he was blind, but he gave me a tight handshake and then moved his head up and down like he was checking me out from head to toe. Don't worry, I'm not blind. My vision has become sensitive to light, hence the doctor prescribed me to use these glasses. Oh, I see. Well, it's nice to meet you, Grandpa. You are a handsome man. I hope you'll enjoy your stay with us. Of course you will, Grandpa. Once Nina's grandpa let go of my hand, I moved away from him. Welcome to our ranch, Justin. I quickly turned around, hearing a creepy female voice right behind me. And there she was, Mrs. Miles, Nina's mother. She was a strikingly beautiful woman, and probably the only one in the family with no physical defect. She wore brown trousers with a tight red blouse, paired with hunting boots, she even had these latex gloves, which made her look pretty elite. My eyes didn't fail to notice the huge diamond ring on her index finger. Um, thanks for having me, Mrs. Miles. <laughs> we have plenty of food, Justin. No one is having you. Everyone started laughing at her weird joke, and I too made an awkward chuckle. <laughs> uh, that was funny. I have prepared the upstairs guest bedroom for you. Nina will be sleeping with us tonight. Don't mind, we are a little orthodox. In our family, we do Thanksgiving differently. Oh, no, it's absolutely fine, Mrs. Miles. Nina took me to the bedroom upstairs, and once we got alone, she locked her arms around my neck and said, So, did you like everyone? Yeah, everyone's nice. Wait till you eat dinner. My mom makes insane Thanksgiving food. Can't wait. She kissed me and went to freshen up. I locked the door and lit up a smoke. Even though I told Nina everything felt fine, in reality, it didn't. I couldn't shake off the fact of how weird her entire family was. The way her limping father stared at me, her grandpa's sturdy handshake, and her mom's weird joke. The call for dinner came, and we sat around this big dining table filled with mashed potatoes, fried chicken, a big roasted turkey, cheesecake, and chocolate donuts. Man... Nina was right. Her mother did know how to cook for Thanksgiving. We all raised our glasses filled with wine when I noticed a big pot boiling on the stove behind us. Mrs. Miles got up saying, Oh, I almost forgot the soup. She brought the pot using her kitchen mittens and placed it right in the middle of the table. Once she opened the lid, a delicious aroma of meat and vegetables filled the entire room. I was almost drooling to taste it. I grabbed the spoon and was about to pour some soup into my bowl when Nina's grandpa slapped hard on my hand, screaming, This isn't for you! Sorry, sorry. I looked at Nina with a confused face and saw her getting awkward. Her father, Arnold, gave me another death stare and said, That's only for us. You can have everything else. Uh, don't mind, Justin. The soup is kind of our family tradition. We only make it on Thanksgiving, with our decade-old special ingredients. And only our family members are allowed to eat it. This traditional recipe is our way of thanking each other, and being grateful to one another. But don't worry, if everything goes fine between you and Nina, you will get to taste it after your wedding. <laughs> Mom, stop it! I smiled in embarrassment and said, I'm sorry, Mrs. Miles, I didn't mean to offend you all. It's fine. I should have told you earlier. Let's eat now. After a quite fulfilling dinner with Nina and her weird family, I went to bed. The entire night, I kept thinking about the delicious smell of that soup. I dozed off, and the grandfather clock woke me up at around 3 a.m. 
Feeling thirsty, I went downstairs. Everyone was dead asleep, so I tiptoed to the kitchen. The soup pot was still in the kitchen oven. I grabbed a ladle to sneak a little taste. In search of a big piece of meat, I churned the ladle into the soup and almost got a heart attack. One by one, things floated to the surface. An eyeball, a small ear, a big toe, and a female ring finger. Ah! I screamed and fell on the floor, realizing the horror. This family has been cooking each other body parts in the name of a traditional Thanksgiving soup. Seems like you couldn't resist the Miles family Thanksgiving soup either. <laughs> there you go. Daisy, I told you the boy would be one of us one day. Enough, guys. Stop teasing the love of my life. We have another special ingredient to add to our soup now. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving! <laughs> Four of them surrounded me with hungry eyes. Even my sweet, innocent girlfriend, Nina, stood there holding a sharp knife in her hand. She grinned like a psycho and said, Mom, why don't you take off your gloves now? I mean, Justin can already guess. Mrs. Miles took off her glove and I saw her ring finger was cut off. Nina's grandpa took off his glasses and I found out he only had one eye. And Mr. Miles was standing barefoot for the first time. I understood that it was his big toe that I saw in that soup. Are you all crazy? No, we just love our family. And this is how we feel the oneness, by tasting each other's flesh and blood. Every year my mom boils this soup, and as the toppings drop our donated body parts. We obviously can't overcook them, you know. It's our secret preserved ingredient. After we get done with the soup, she preserves those body parts again in a jar until the next Thanksgiving. Oh my god! Come on, you don't have to be scared. It's only a one-time thing. So, what are you going to donate? Take out his eye! We already have one! Ooh, how about this nose? Mom, Justin is our guest. Shouldn't we let him choose? Tears rolled down my eyes. I knew I was trapped. I knew that there was no escape for me now. Nina sat down beside me and kissed me on the cheek. It's just one time. Please, I don't want to lose you. Just do it for me, love. This one time only. I closed my eyes and nodded my head. Nina and I got married last year. The photographs only looked beautiful after I put on my prosthetic nose. The wounds have healed. It doesn't hurt anymore. I'm happy it was a one-time thing. And this Thanksgiving, I'll get to taste the traditional Miles soup being one of them. Four of us were sitting near the fireplace sipping beer when Joffrey said, I have a surprise for you all. Lisa, who was half drunk already, said, I don't think I will be surprised. I saw it on prom night, remember? Jeez, you're such a bad girl, Lisa. Kenneth said, while eyeing her perfect hourglass figure. I was probably the only one who remained silent out of discomfort. The entire school knew how close Joffrey and Lisa were during high school, but then she met Kenneth at our farewell party, and things changed forever. In no time, Joffrey found them making out in the corner, completely sloshed. That was the last time we four saw each other. I still respect Joffrey by not overreacting. He didn't even react. He finished the beer in his hand while Lisa and Kenneth stood there, highly embarrassed and ashamed. Joffrey then put the empty beer bottle on the kitchen countertop and said to Lisa, All's the best for whatever's about to come. That's all. Joffrey walked away, never showed his face again to any of us. Now, as we sit in his farmhouse, accepting the holiday invitation, I feel highly awkward, and it seems that Kenneth and Lisa still have no remorse for breaking Joffrey's heart. Joffrey ignored Lisa's awful joke and said, I want to play a game. What kind of game? Fine with me, but I want something thrilling, something that's spooky and scary. <laughs> Oh yes, there will be blood. What? Just joking. But it's going to be the last man standing wins type of game. Great, 
I'm in. Lisa, are you in? Um, fine. What about you, Max? Okay, I'll play too. Joffrey clapped his hands and screamed. Let's begin, then! He poured himself another drink and said, All of you will be playing for yourself. The last one standing will have a chance to win a huge prize, only if he or she is willing to risk it all. Damn, you sound like those murder mystery freaks. It's the rules! The rules of our game have been made very clear. You need to abide by those rules. Fine, we will. Why do I have the feeling that I'm going to be the winner? You're overestimating yourself, Kenneth. Joffrey let out a weird smile and said, Wait one second, let me get into my costume. He went to the room downstairs and closed the door. After five minutes, he came out and dressed up like the famous slasher villain Jigsaw. Yes, you heard that right. He had his face painted red with those red spirals drawn on his cheeks. He even wore red contacts to make his eyeballs look like Jigsaw. Kenneth said in a scared voice, Whoa, you're pretty serious, huh? <laughs> Joffrey handed us a red box and said, All the best. As we opened the box to look for our first clue, a strong chemical smell hit us right away, and our vision began to blur. Before any of us could say anything, we collapsed onto the ground. When I woke up, I saw three of us tied to each other, and above us hung a sharp spear-like object. What the hell is this, Joffrey? I told you, there would be blood. Hey! Untie us now! Joffrey smiled as if he couldn't care less, then said, In three minutes, the spear will drop down. Whoever keeps standing will be dead. You better not waste time. <laughs> he sat on a chair and started watching us, playing for our lives. We were moving, kicking, trying everything. Are you crazy? I was once! Not anymore! Tears rolled down from Lisa's eyes as she realized the irony in Joffrey's answer. The spear began dangling over our heads with each passing second. Somehow, I managed to free myself first and went to help Lisa and Kenneth. That's when Joffrey fired a shot. You play for yourself, Max! Stop, or I will shoot you! Like a statue... I stood there and watched Lisa and Kenneth struggle. It was probably five seconds away from the time when Lisa finally set herself free, and the spear struck Kenneth's head like a lightning. It pierced him inside from tip to toe, and we watched horror enfolding everywhere. Ah! Kenneth! Lisa cried, and Joffrey laughed seeing her pain. Now you know how it feels to be separated from the love of your life! Are you happy now? Are you happy seeing us suffer like this? Suffering? <laughs> you haven't seen anything yet. Saying this, he turned off the room lights and we found ourselves standing in complete darkness. What's happening now? Max, what's going on? Suddenly, someone splashed patrol on us from the darkness and I screamed. Joffrey, what are you doing? What have I ever done to you? I hurt you that night, Max. You were the one who said a loser like Joffrey never deserved Lisa anyways. I freaking heard you. And then he lit up a candle. His face looked even more frightening in the candlelight. He started walking towards us. Lisa screamed. Oh my god, he he's planning to burn us alive. Max, back out, back out, Max. Lisa and I kept moving back without even knowing what was behind us. Our backs finally hit the wall, and a large wooden window creaked open. In the moonlight, we saw tons of booby traps set on the ground outside the window. Whoever steps on them will be severed into pieces. Suddenly, Joffrey smiled and said, Now, it's time for your greatest sacrifice. One of you can walk out that window, and I will turn on the lights. And if none of you does, I'll throw this burning candle at you, so you both burn down to ashes. So, what's it gonna be? 
Joffrey, please, please stop this madness. We, we can start again, okay? I'll, I'll do anything you say, just please. When faced with death, who should live versus who will live are two entirely separate things. Live or die, make your choice. Suddenly, the most heinous idea came to my mind. Lisa and Kenneth have now done more wrong to Joffrey than me. They're the main reason why I'm in this hellhole right now, and I am not ready to die for nothing. I looked at Joffrey and he let out a huge grin. He must have read my mind. I then looked at Lisa one last time and pushed her out of the window. Her blood-curdling scream along with the sound of closing booby traps echoed around the farmhouse. The tearing of flesh and shattering of bone made me numb. When it finally got over, Joffrey turned on the lights. He raised his arm and I saw a small key in his palm. I walked towards him with great fear. Congratulations, you won the biggest prize, your life. <laughs> Game over. <laughs> what, what is this key for? So you can get out of the house and never come back. What's gonna happen to their bodies? I'll feed them to the crocodiles. Do you have crocodiles in your pond? <laughs> I would have showed you, but that level is for senior players. <laughs> I somehow drove away that night. A week later, I saw a post on Lisa's Facebook account saying she and Kenneth are taking a long holiday to Paris and will be off social media for a while. Joffrey came all prepared, no doubt. I keep checking the news, expecting to see cops searching for Lisa and Kenneth, but nothing like that ever makes it to the headline. I don't want to see Joffrey ever again. Just one piece of advice for those who might meet him in this lifetime. Don't even dare to wrong him. Just don't. There was a time when I was extremely unhappy with my looks. I was the average loner girl throughout all of my schools. No one made an effort to hang out with me. I remember the first time I was called fat by my workplace crush. I was so depressed that I went for drinks straight away after work. After a couple of shots and crying in the public washroom for an hour, I decided to head home. On my way, I thought I should stop at 7-Eleven and buy gum. I bought a lotto ticket there, just to try my luck. The next couple of days, I googled the winning numbers and, to my surprise, I got all six of them. After hyperventilating and nearly passing out, I decided I will spend this money to achieve the body I always wanted, that I will be like those hot girls who make men go crazy. I collected my money and drove straight to LA. After searching enough, I found out about this plastic surgeon who is capable of doing all kinds of life-changing surgeries. His PA gave me an appointment to visit his office the next morning. Taking my money and a lot of hope for a new look, I went to his office. The receptionist pointed toward the waiting area and told me to wait for my turn. There were couches and chairs set up for clients to sit and wait. Another guy was sitting on the couch. He wore a black hoodie and kept his head down. I sat down opposite him. The guy was constantly tapping his feet, which said how impatient he was to see the surgeon. I was feeling a little curious and wanted to see his face, so I dropped my phone just to pick it up and get a sneak peek at his face. As my phone hit the ground, the guy stopped tapping his feet and lifted his face. I kid you not, his face gave me goosebumps. He had lips bigger than a duck. Name any fillers that exist in the field of plastic surgery, that guy had it. His cheeks were uplifted higher than mountaintops, and his eyebrows could be mistaken as caterpillars any day. Seeing me stare at him without blinking, the guy let out a creepy grin and said, Don't you like what you see? Uh, no, I, I mean, yeah. I'm sorry to stare at you like that. <laughs> Is this your first time here? Yeah, I came to LA recently. To get the body you want? Yeah, if that's possible. <laughs> this is LA, darling. Everything is possible. I used to look ugly once, but now look at me. People easily mistake me for Kim Kardashian. I almost got hiccups hearing this. This man was completely delusional. 
He had no idea how outrageous his looks were and that he looks nothing like Kim K. But still, I awkwardly smiled just to be nice to him. We were talking when the PA came and said that the plastic surgeon has canceled all his appointments today as he had some surgery meeting to attend. She told us to come tomorrow. God, nothing is in order anymore. You just wasted my entire afternoon. Saying this, he got up and I got up too. We both came out of the office and he offered me to go to his place for a drink. Since I knew no one in the city and wanted to talk to someone who already went through plastic surgery, I agreed. He said his name is Joe and he lives nearby. We got into a cab and he took me to a beautiful apartment, which looked expensive. Wow, your place looks amazing. Thanks, babe. Once I get a big house, I'll do the same decor Kim has done in her house. You like Kim, huh? Like? <laughs> I am crazy about her. I want to look exactly like her. Just a couple more surgeries and I will be Kim 2.0. <laughs> he handed me a drink and then said in a mysterious voice, Do you want to see something? Um, sure. He grabbed my hand and took me to his bedroom. There was a big closet in his bedroom. He walked up to the closet and opened both doors. What I saw gave me creeps about Joe. Instead of clothes, his closet wall was filled with photos of Kim Kardashian. There was a square table in the middle which had candles, a human skull, and some other bizarre things that no one would ever dream of seeing in someone's closet. What? What is all this? My cavern. <laughs> I told you I want to be just like her. Do you know what this is? He picked up a small, transparent pouch and emptied it onto his hand. A small black hairball came out from it. Ugh, what is that? This is Kim's hair. I sneaked into her backyard one night and stole her garbage bags. You did what? Yeah, she must have brushed her beautiful hair the night before. <sighs> Saying this, he smelled the hairball like it was a bouquet of roses. I felt like vomiting, but somehow controlled myself. He put the hairball back into the pouch and then picked up a small wooden box from the table. Once he opened it, I received shock number two. The box was filled with chopped edges of fingernails. I didn't have to guess to whom they belonged. This guy is an obsessed stalker. He not only wants to look like Kim K, but he wants to be like her. Why do you have all this stuff? And what's up with that human skull? <laughs> oh, I am doing some rituals. I am praying to the Dark Lord to turn me into Kim K. That's why I need things that are physically a part of her. But it seems like all of this isn't enough. Do you think these things work? They do. The Dark Lord will grant all of your wishes in exchange for a sacrifice. As he said this, I saw the look on his face change. His eyes got wide and he smiled ear to ear, looking at me. What kind of sacrifice? What are you saying? The ultimate human sacrifice to make the Dark Lord grant my wishes, stupid girl. <laughs> you still don't understand, huh? Understand what? You are my sacrifice, babe. I was looking for someone like you for months. Someone who is not from here and has no one to look for them if they go missing. <laughs> Saying this, he suddenly took out a knife from his back pocket, which I had no idea about, and came to stab me with it. <laughs> I wasn't ready for this sudden attack, but still, I tried to move away. Even though I was saved by an inch, he still cut me on the cheek. I turned around and started running toward the door. You can't escape! I won't let you! Just one sacrifice, just one! And I will be the next Kim Kardashian! The world will be crazy about me! He chased me with the knife. I was close to the door, but I realized he has locked the door and I won't have enough time to unlock it before this creepy Ken doll ends up killing me. There was a small coffee table in the dining and thank God for my extra pounds. I picked that table up and threw it at him, aiming his head. The glass of the coffee table broke on his bald head, covering him with shattered, sharp pieces. His duck lips cut open and he screamed. 
You just ruined my lips. I spent my entire family wealth just to get these. You freaking witch. And he broke down on the floor, holding his bleeding face. In the meantime, I unlocked the main door and came out of his place. One last time, I looked back to see him sitting on the floor, looking at me with vengeful eyes and sobbing like a six-year-old. I screamed with utmost disgust. You are the worst Kim K lookalike I have seen in my entire life, and I pray to your dark lord that you burn in hell! I ran far away from his apartment. I didn't stay the next day and never went to any plastic surgeon. I came back to my town, started my bakery and joined a gym to lose weight so I can live a healthy life. The only change in my look that I did was obtaining a slimmer figure, and that's it. I have no complaints about my look, and whenever I see someone obsessing over a celebrity or star, I stay the hell away from them. The image you just saw was of a strange man dressed like a minion found at Omegle chat room. The true identity of this man is unknown. The following story you are about to see is loosely based on this man's creepy appearance. I was 16 when this incident happened. My uncle and aunt visited us during Halloween with my cousin, Riley. She was two years younger than me at the time, so on the night of Halloween, we had a delicious dinner with our family, and then my mom and dad went to their friend's house, taking my aunt and uncle with them. Don't do anything reckless, girls, and be sure to lock all the doors behind us, okay? Yes, mom. They left around nine. Riley and I had the house to ourselves for the first time, so we were pretty excited. We decided to have this late night snack in my room and watch some scary movies. I prepared a cheese dip and poured a bowl full of nachos. Riley grabbed a tub of chocolate ice cream and we started climbing the stairs. Have you heard about Omegle? Riley asked while following me. As surprising as it may sound, I hadn't heard about it back then. So I said, no, is that a movie you wanna watch? No, <laughs> God, you are so funny. What is it then? I placed the food tray on my bed and sat down. Riley sat beside me and said, It's an online website where people can talk to strangers around the world. Really? Is that safe? I've tried it only once at my friend Trevor's house. We met a nice girl, though. She was from India. We talked and cracked some jokes. It was fun. That sounds nice. And the great part is we don't even have to open an account. It's random, and we can disconnect anytime we want. Realizing this was a good idea to spend a fun night, Riley and I decided to chat with strangers on Omegle. I fired up my laptop, placed it on the bed right in front of us, and began talking to strangers. We got connected to a girl who claimed to be a huge fan of Justin Bieber. After talking to her for a few minutes, we got bored of her ranting about Justin, so we disconnected the call to try someone new. The website screen buffered for a few seconds, and then we got connected to a middle-aged man. He was dressed as a minion and staring at us with a smile. The occasion being Halloween, we didn't feel anything odd about his attire. He spoke, imitating the funny voice of the minions. Bello! <laughs> Hi, what's your name? Kevin. Hi, I'm Nina, and this is my sister, Riley. I want banana! I like your Halloween costume. Thank you! We were feeling entertained by his minion voice and mimicry. Riley took a spoonful of ice cream and was just about to eat it when suddenly the guy screamed. Gelato! <laughs> Gelato! And started clapping like a four-year-old. I laughed, seeing how much he was in character. Riley smiled too and said, So what is your real name? That's when his face changed. He got really upset and started crying. <laughs> Not expecting a middle-aged man to cry like that, we got shocked. The man went to wipe his tears and, in the process, kind of messed up the yellow-white paint on his face. Now, when he was done crying, he looked at us. A few seconds ago, the guy who seemed funny was now looking very creepy. His eyes were bloodshot, and he screamed in a rough voice. So... You two think I'm a fake, huh? Is there no one who appreciates me? Hey, sorry if we offended you. You are very funny. Hearing this, a weird smile appeared on his face and kept staring at us while smiling like that. He wasn't even blinking, only staring at his camera, holding that creepy grin. Feeling awkward and cringed, Riley said, Well, happy Halloween. It was nice to meet you. 
Don't you dare walk out on me! What? Excuse me? I said, don't even think about disconnecting this call! You twig witches think you own the world and you can do as you please! I am here to show you where you belong! What the hell is wrong with you, man? The man suddenly got up from his chair and went somewhere. Meanwhile, the call was still connected. Feeling scared and disturbed by his sudden change of behavior, I said to Riley, What are you waiting for? Just disconnect the call. That man is a creep. No, I'm going to set him straight when he comes back. After that, I'll disconnect. Riley got very angry and had no other option. I too waited for the man to come back. After a few seconds, we heard a girl's cry. The cry was getting louder each second. And then, suddenly, the man moved his computer screen which illuminated his entire room. What we saw made our hearts skip a beat. He was holding a metal chain, which was a dog leash, and instead of a dog, that leash was tied around the neck of a teenage girl, probably my age. Half her face was burnt. We could see the exposed gum, teeth, and white cheekbones gushing from the burnt flesh. The eye on that burnt side was bulging out of her eye socket. Her body was painted purple, and she had a purple nightdress on. There was also a messy purple hair wig, and it wasn't difficult to guess which character she was playing. The man had turned her into an evil minion, and now he was playing the role of her master. He looked at the girl and said, Tell them who is your god. Tell them! You are master. Tell them why! (laughs) My master is brave, and one of a kind. If you disobey him, he will smash your spine. (laughs) Right. Oh my god, who are you? Tell us, where are you? We'll call the cops for you. I screamed, seeing the poor girl. But the girl kept repeating the lines. My master is brave, and one of a kind. If you disobey him, he will smash your spine. What have you done to her, you freak? (laughs) Doesn't she look nice? Riley and I decided to call the cops, when suddenly we heard another voice inside the man's room. Jordan, what's taking you so long? I didn't bring my brother and his wife to your house just to get bored at a Halloween party. And the speaker of the voice walked right in front of the screen. Mom? Oh my god, you guys know him? My mom saw me and Riley on the screen, and her face turned pale. We realized what kind of sick Halloween party our parents were having at their friend Jordan's house, who was all this time pretending to be the funny minion, Kevin. I couldn't take it anymore. I disconnected the call right away. Riley started crying, realizing how evil our parents are. We called the cops and told them everything. What happened after that? put a full stop to our lives. The cops tracked down this man named Jordan and found his house, but it was too late for that poor girl. Once they reached there, they found the entire house on fire. And later, they only discovered one body, which was a teenage girl reported missing last week. Jordan and my parents were gone. Even my uncle and aunt went with them. We have no idea where they are, and we haven't gotten a call from them yet. Riley is now under foster care, and I'm living with my grandma. Our life has become purposeless and a series of trauma. Both Riley and I are going through therapy because very few kids in the world get to discover such horrifying truths about their parents. The only thing I want to say to my parents is that, Mom, Dad, if you're watching this, stay the hell away from me. I'll be better off without you two sick psychos. Being born in a poor neighborhood is not easy. Even as a child, you have to experience all sorts of things that would not happen in a wealthier neighborhood. Among all those things, insecurity can be one of the most important issues. It may sound horrible, but you're used to being robbed, to losing what little you have. We know it's a fact of life, and we accept it. But that night, something different happened. That night... We explored firsthand the world of madness and limitless cruelty. And although nothing material was stolen from us, my family and I lost something inside us 
something we can never get back. That same day, my husband had gotten a job, so we were able to buy ice cream for the kids. They hadn't had dessert in a long time. We were all watching TV as a family when all of a sudden, the power went out. <laughs> easy, easy, the power just went out. It will be back soon, sweetie. Hey, Bobby, do you want to help me check the fuse box? Yes, Daddy. I'm not afraid of the dark. <laughs> I know you're not, champ, but at your sister's age, you were terrified. You're right. Relax, Ellie. Soon you'll grow up and stop being afraid of the dark, like me. Aw, that is so cute. Come on, boy. That generator won't check itself. When they left, I was alone with Ellie. I lit some candles and left them around the table. I turned on the radio and distracted myself by listening to music. Until out of nowhere, a scream distracted me. It was coming from the basement. Ellie, go to your room and close the door. I'll be back as soon as possible. Yes, Mom, but I'll take a candle. I ran to the basement to see what happened. When I got there, I saw Bobby. He was crying with his flashlight on the floor. My baby! What happened to you? He fell on one of the little cars I told him not to leave on the floor. My knee hurts. Now you see what happens when you don't listen to your father, Bobby? I'm sorry. I know you do. Hey, Bobby, cover your ears for a minute. I have something to say to your mommy. Yes, Daddy. This time I will behave. Abby, there's something that's bothering me. What's wrong? You're scaring me. There's a cut wire in the fuse box. It could have been some rat or maybe the wires were old. But, I don't know, look at these wires. Don't you think the cut is too... precise? Are you trying to imply that there might be someone in the house? I don't know. For now, let's go upstairs together and... Wait a minute, where's Ellie? I told her to go to her room and lock herself in. Let's go get to her right now. Yeah. Son, Mom and I will go look for your sister in the house. Maybe some bad man came in. You'll stay here with your flashlight and behave yourself. We'll be back as soon as possible, understand? Yes, Daddy. Look, it's Mr. Rogers. Do you think you can take care of it while we're upstairs? Yes, Dad. I'll make sure nothing bad happens. Greg, are you sure about this? Yeah, I checked the whole place as soon as we got down. There's no one here. We both walked to Ellie's room. Bobby locked himself in the basement. Our son was definitely fearless. When we got there... I gasped and snatched my husband's flashlight. Ellie's door was open, and I told her to lock herself in. I entered the room quickly, and Ellie was in the corner. Near her, there was a six-foot-two man in a hospital gown pointing at her. She is my daughter. His voice was quiet and calm, but at the same time, heavy. Every word that came out of his mouth conveyed peace. But a bad peace. Like death. The man turned around and my husband and I gasped, terrified. His face was all distorted. He had a huge smile, but the look didn't fit his face. His eyes were tetric, twisted and cruel. She is so beautiful. So sweet. Daddy loves you. In response to these words, my daughter started to cry desperately. I ran to the girl and grabbed her, took her away, and we closed Ellie's door and went to the kitchen running. What just happened? Who, who was that man? We gotta call the police. Yes! We need to get Bobby and get out of here now! Abby, what are you doing with that little girl? That little girl? She's our daughter, you moron! Abby, Ellie wasn't dressed like that. Mom, Dad, here you are. Sorry I didn't go to my room. I wanted to eat ice cream before it melted. Are you mad? Abby, who do you have in your hands? I slowly ducked my head and face and looked down. In my arms was not Ellie, but a little girl with one eye. She was looking at me with her one but huge eye open. The little girl was trembling, and before I could understand what was happening, she bit me violently on the arm and let go. Oh! Oh! 
the girl fell down on all fours, and after looking at us all like a wild animal, she went out the kitchen door. It may be scary, but I wanted to follow her. She was just a child. Abby, where are you going? She's just a kid. She's scared. When I opened the door, the man from before was standing in front of me. Without letting me react, he grabbed me by the hair and dragged me into Ellie's room. My husband and daughter ran in my direction, but this person locked the door with a piece of furniture. Immediately, without saying a word to me, he jumped up next to me and started biting my face. His daughter, who was under Ellie's bed, quickly jumped out from under the bed and also started biting me, but my legs... Ah! Please help me! I thought I was going to die, devoured by that horrendous family. But after a lot of effort, Greg managed to open the door and picked away the man who was attacking me. As a reflex action, the girl also backed away. My husband grabbed me and pulled me out before the man could jump back in, and I managed to close the door on him. As they both tried to get out of the room, Greg and I held the door, and Ellie, who didn't understand what was going on but wanted to help, put small boxes on the door to block it. After a few seconds, we heard a noise at the window, and the banging stopped. I opened the door as Greg ran to get Bobby, and the room was empty. They had both gone out the window. I went to the hospital to get my wounds treated while Greg went to the police station. Greg came in furious. He told me that when he said what neighborhood he was from, they ignored him and told him if he doesn't want insecurity, to move out of there. When we got back to my house, Greg had already fixed the light. I turned on the TV and found a familiar face. The man had been captured. They started talking about him and explained how he was a psychiatric patient who escaped during a storm. A short time later, he was seen breaking into his ex-partner's house and stealing her daughter, who was just a little baby. Nobody knew the whereabouts of both people, but it was said that the man had resorted to cannibalism. There is something strange here. Where is the girl? <coughs> what was that? Have you ever heard of the back rooms? The place is a parallel universe that we can all access while we sleep, whether we want to or not. In this video, we will know the story of a young man who got too close to the back rooms, and his worst mistake was to believe he was alone. Ah, the back rooms. Few internet mysteries have haunted me as much as the back rooms. For as long as I can remember, I've seen a lot of creepy pastas and unbelievable internet stories. But when I heard the story of the back rooms, I knew it was real. I knew I had to know that place. For all those who don't know, have you ever dreamed of a labyrinth? With a bunch of yellow offices that led to nowhere? Ever felt the smell of wet carpet in a dream? You may not even remember it, but you may have been there. Many people enter the back rooms. What not many people know is that if the dream is too deep, very few make it out. Man, I swear I've been in there. I've been in the back rooms. Are you sure it worked for you? Like me, Diego, my best friend, was also obsessed with the idea of getting into the back rooms. So when he told me he got in two nights in a row, I was shocked. Yeah, it's easier than you think. You... You just kind of have to think about it as much as you can when you go to sleep and you'll be there. But how do you know about it if you're sleeping? Easy. You just have to have sleep paralysis. When you have sleep paralysis, you're half asleep and half awake so you can think more rationally. I don't know, man. Isn't it dangerous? Paralysis makes dreams much deeper. Well, look at me. I'm here and nothing has happened. <sighs> I guess you're right. I admit that when I tried to have a sleep paralysis that night, I was terrified. But that wasn't going to stop me from meeting the back rooms. I did everything I could to make it happen. I ate a lot and went to bed quickly, leaving the TV on at high volume. At bedtime, I followed every step Diego had given me. And after just the first try, I was in the back rooms. I knew I was dreaming, but 
At the same time, I felt the smell of wet carpet. I felt cold, scared, and excited. It was as if I was awake, as, as if I'd been transported to another world. Without fear, I walked the labyrinth of the back rooms. Everything was like in the legend. The walls were all the same. There was an aura of eternal disorientation, and my only companions were the lockers and the dead ends that occupied almost the entire maze. Was I at the beginning of the labyrinth? Was I about to leave? I began to panic. This was no longer fun. I wanted to go back home. I ran desperately through the labyrinth. Maybe I could find the exit by chance. Seconds, minutes, and hours passed, and nothing. I fell to the floor in tears, and at my worst moment, a cat approached me. Hey, cutie. What are you doing here? Oh, honey. I asked for this, but I don't think you tried to come in here. We'll find our way out together, won't we? Renewed with energy, I continued looking for the exit, much calmer and accompanied. A few minutes later, I arrived at another dead end, but with a particularity. There was a girl with her back turned at the end of it. Surely, she was another lost person, so I approached her. Hey, do you need help? In response to my call, the girl turned around. At that moment, I realized that I was the one who needed help. The girl had no face, just a huge hole surrounded by teeth and a circular shape. It was as if her face was a mouth. I grabbed the cat and walked backward, slowly and carefully. The girl dropped her back to the ground, and before falling to the floor, she put her hands on the ground and stood on all fours, as if she was a kind of spider. In this position, it ran at full speed towards me, so I did the same. Whatever it was, it was faster than me, so at a turn, I hid in a locker before it caught me. Hello? Anybody here? That voice was familiar. Was it Diego? What was he doing here? I was about to open the locker to tell him to run, but as soon as Diego was in my sight, it was too late. The monster came out of the corner at high speed, and standing in two kicks, sunk its teeth into his head, lifting him up and swallowing him as if there was a bottomless hole inside of that little body. The only thing I could do was stand in the locker with the cat, watching how that being was swallowing my friend in one bite, leaving no trace. To my terror, it wasn't over there. The monster walked in my direction. I felt the sweat pouring down my forehead, over my body and my head, until I realized that something was wrong. That wasn't sweat. I looked at my hands and arms. They were full of cockroaches. My whole body was full of cockroaches. I felt them walking all over my face. There were more and more. I looked down, and to my surprise, the cat had its mouth open. The cockroaches were coming out of it. At the time, I could see how horrible red eyes were watching me from inside the animal's mouth. That was not a cat. It was just disguised as one. I wanted to scream, cry, and run desperately. I wanted to throw that horrible being out of my hands, but I couldn't. I looked up, and behind the locker, the monster was still there, standing against the locker, inspecting if anyone was nearby. I closed my eyes in tears and just prayed that everything would pass as quickly as possible. The behavior of the cockroaches had changed. They were no longer moving erratically. They were trying to get into my mouth, my nose, and my eyes. They were all over my face. I opened my eyes and the being was no longer there. This was my chance. I rammed the locker while throwing the cat as far away as possible. 
I crawled across the floor, pulling some cockroaches out of my face and spitting out the ones that had gotten to my mouth. When I opened my eyes, I forgot about the cockroaches. Behind the curve, the monster from before was waiting for me. He had set a trap for me. My first reaction was to run as fast as I could while the creature, on all fours, ran after me, getting closer and closer. As it was about to catch up with me, I saw a red door in front of me, and I entered before it caught me with its huge mouth. A strong light blinded me, and I felt an impact on my body. When I opened my eyes, I was full of mud, in the square, a few blocks from my house. When I entered my house, everyone was surprised. No one saw where I appeared from. No one saw me leave the house. I just appeared there. I called Diego, but no one answered. Shortly after, his parents called me to ask me if I knew anything about him. A few days later, the whole town was surrounded by missing posters with my friend's face on them. No one ever saw him again. Since that day, I avoid thinking about the back rooms at all costs, for fear of ending up there when I dream. I regret the day I became obsessed with that damned place and provoking the beings that live there. I'll warn you once again, you can all end up in the back room. If you ever dream of that place, don't trust anyone or anything. Just look for the exit and run. In this video, we will meet Ali London, this controversial internet figure obsessed with being just like Jimin, from BTS to the point of having surgery on his entire face, gained a lot of fame from his strange personality. Some say he's funny, but in this dramatization based on theories that circulate the network, we will see a dark side that no one knows that this character could potentially have. My name is James. I was always a very fanatic rock person. So when BTS exploded, I wasn't very attracted to the band. Unlike me, Mary, my best friend, was obsessed with its members. I had a weird friendship with Mary. Growing up, we never got along. But since we were neighbors, our parents forced us to spend time together. Eventually, we became friends. And years later, when I moved out on my own, we still saw each other. You have to come, James. I promise it'll be worth it. When you see as many fans as I do, I'm sure you'll be passionate about BTS, too. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's not my thing. Oh, please. We'll even have the meeting at a celebrity's house. Uh, okay, I'll go. But only for you. I was hesitant to go. I felt that I was left over in that place and BTS fans had a bad reputation. But when I got to the meeting, my opinion changed. Everyone seemed to be very nice. They made me feel like I was one of them very quickly. They were very passionate about the band, all except for one person, the owner of the house, who I knew was an internet celebrity, but for the wrong reasons. Ollie London was always a controversial figure. This man went viral on the internet for having several surgeries to be identical to Jimin, a member of BTS. Criticism on the internet was not long in coming, that he didn't respect the band, that he was just looking for attention, that what he was doing was cultural appropriation, and in general, he was not well liked. As soon as she saw him arrive with drinks, Mary screamed with excitement and went to hug him, but he ignored her. The man only looked at me obsessively. Oh my god, your skin is so beautiful. Thank you? Look at your skin. My god, it's perfect. Your complexion, your build, your features. You look just like him. You mean the cute guy from BTS? Suddenly, the place was filled with silence and everyone looked at me in bewilderment. Cute guy from BTS. His name is Jimin. Didn't you know? I'm sorry. It's just that I'm not a fan of the band. I just came here to accompany... What do you mean you're not a BTS fan? You who are privileged with that face! You come here to make fun of us? 
No, I didn't want to disrespect. I'll leave. No, don't go. This is my fault. I'm sorry, I'm a little excited. How about you stay here after the meeting and I'll get you a cup of tea? I don't think that would be good. Yes, we'll stay. Mary covered my mouth, vouching for me, to which I resignedly agreed. The rest of the day was somewhat awkward after that encounter. No fan was smiling like before. Mary, on the other hand, was full of joy, as if the best was yet to come. Everyone left a little earlier than expected, and against my better judgment, Mary and I were left alone with Ollie. So, nice house, I said uncomfortably, to break the silence. Did you always have such beautiful, perfect skin, Jamie? My name is James. Yes, yes, whatever. People must stop you in the street all the time, right? You look just like Jimin. Actually, I'm not much alike. I'm just oriental. It's so humble. I'll go get the tea, darlings. Don't move from here. Mary, we have to go. Now. What? Why? Oli is offering you his tea. Don't you see, Mary? That man is crazy. Surely he'll poison us. Okay, you're right. There's something fishy going on here. Let's go. Yes! Finally you understood! Let's go! I started to walk slowly away from the house while Mary followed me from behind, but suddenly I felt an impact on my head. My knees began to weaken and I fell to the ground. As my eyes closed, I could see in my last conscious second Mary standing behind me with a broken vase in her hand. My eyes began to open. At first, I didn't know where I was or what had happened. I felt a strange sensation on my face as if something was squeezing me. As I was remembering what happened, a horrible stabbing pain went through my whole face. I tried to move, but I couldn't. I was tied up. I looked ahead and was frightened. I was looking at a mirror, and in it, I could see that my whole face except for my eyes and nose was bandaged. I see you've woken up, honey. In front of me was Ollie, but something was wrong. His face was much uglier than before. He had a huge amount of skin taped to his face. His twisted gaze was more intense than ever. He felt like he could pierce me with his eyes. I understand that you must be very confused. Your friend is really violent. Hey, shh, shh, shh. This is going to be hard to process, so I'll just say it straight out. See this beautiful skin covering my face? This is your skin. I pulled it off your face while you were sleeping. But listen, I'm not a monster. I understand that you're ugly now because of me, but I'll fix it. Without allowing me to give him an answer, Ollie moved my chair to the mirror and from a drawer took out a makeup kit. I could do nothing but cry. I was helpless, at the mercy of whatever this psychopath who stuck my skin to his face could do to me. After I settled down in front of the mirror, he kept looking at me with those schizophrenic eyes and started to paint some lips on the bandages while my tears were running through his fingers. Hey. You have to be careful with your friend, you know? She's crazy. I didn't answer. I just kept crying. To tell you the truth, this was all her idea. I'm sorry to tell you that she brought you here on purpose. It's unbelievable what some crazy fans can do for you. While Ollie was still doing my makeup, his face was almost glued to mine. I could see pieces of skin falling on my body. While this was happening, I had managed to free myself from the badly tied rope in my hands and was ready to escape, but to tell the truth, I was afraid. Ollie didn't take an eye off me, staring at me unblinkingly, obsessed with not missing a second of what was left of my face with his makeup. When he finished using the lipstick, he let go of it to grab the eyeliner, and in that brief moment of distraction, I slammed it against the wall and started to run away from the house. As I ran, I could see how his face had hit the wall, and all the pieces of my skin were falling off. 
Oh my god, my face! How could you do this to me? Without paying attention to him, I ran out of his house. As soon as I got out, I tried to take the bandage out of my mouth so I could scream for help. But I stopped when I felt something stinging on my back. It was Mary with a knife in my back. Hey buddy, I hope you don't tell anything about what happened today. Make up a good excuse. Remember, I'm still your parents' neighbor. You don't want to make me mad. At her threat, I just nodded, and before I knew it, I was alone. Mary had entered Ollie's house. It had been several months since the incident happened. I still can't bring myself to see my parents and friends. I told them I left the country for a big surprise business deal. I'm constantly going to surgery to try to get back on the streets. I never saw Mary again, but my parents always tell me that she always comes to visit them. As for Ollie, I received a box in the mail that he sent me. When I opened it, there were some pieces of my skin that Mary tore off, and next to it, a letter and some chocolates. In the letter, Ollie told me that the surgeon said that he could not attach the skin, and that as an apology, he would return it to me and give me some chocolates. When I read this, I fell to the floor and started crying. I would never again go to any meeting of fans of anything. Being a parent is not easy. You have to constantly keep an eye out for your children's safety. After escaping an abusive marriage, I finally found my soulmate. My husband Greg loves me and my daughter Ella from the bottom of his heart. Even though he is Ella's stepfather, he cares for her more than her own father ever did. We were a happy family. Every weekend, we would go out to the movies or play games at the mall. On our way back, we would stop for dinner at some fast food chain. My daughter Ella loves fast food, and her favorite is McDonald's. She would always beg for us to go there, not just for the food, but also the Happy Meal toys. I would buy her a Happy Meal just to see the smile on her face. So this one Friday, we were making our usual stroll around the mall when my husband pointed out a swimsuit shop. He was being kinky, and I began blushing. We were laughing and planning to buy a swimsuit when I heard Ella talking to a weird-looking man. He was dressed in a white shirt and had an eerie appearance. They were standing quite close to me. My husband went ahead to buy the swimsuit for me, and I waited outside to keep an eye on this man. Now, I never yell at my daughter. I always try to protect her without being intimidating, so I decided to watch the guy without calling Ella back to me. I didn't want to be rude, so I just waited for their conversation to end naturally. In the beginning, the conversation was pretty normal. So how old are you, little angel? I'm six. I have a sister, but she's staying home with my nana. I see. You are a big girl, then. What's your favorite color? Blue. What's yours? Mine is red. Do you want to know why? So far, things were going normal, and I had nothing to worry about. But suddenly, everything took a dark turn. Being interested in the man's favorite color, Ella asked, What? Tell me. <laughs> because it's the color of blood. Do you know what is blood? Yes, my teacher says it runs in our veins. Right, absolutely right. But we can't see them from outside. We have to cut ourselves if we wish to see blood. I can tell you it's so much fun. <laughs> my face turned pale hearing this, and I quickly walked toward them. I was furious with the man's choice of topic while speaking to a six-year-old and couldn't contain my anger. Such words can have a damaging impact on kids, so I lost it and slapped the weird man right across his cheek. Not expecting the sudden slap, the man yelled. What the? Are you crazy? Do you really think this is what you should be telling a six-year-old? To cut herself so she can see blood? What kind of psycho are you? People stopped to watch the drama. I went on yelling, and my husband came out hearing my loud voice. I insulted the frack out of that man, and surprisingly, he didn't even say a single word to me. Only his filthy eyes kept giving me a death stare. Once he saw people gathering around us, he quickly left the scene. My husband asked if he had done anything inappropriate, 
But I told him no, he was just being sketchy and saying some crazy things to our daughter. Ella got sad, and I didn't want her to think it was her fault. I hugged her and said it was the man's fault and he got what he deserved. I soon calmed down, and to cheer everybody up, we decided to go to McDonald's. The restaurant was right around the street, so we parked our car and went in. As we sat down, after ordering Ella's favorite Happy Meal and burgers and fries for us, the man at the mall slowly faded from my mind. We were cheering and laughing like a happy family while eagerly waiting for our food. A few minutes later, our order finally arrived. Look, Mommy, I got minions! Ella showed me the cute little yellow minion toy she got with her Happy Meal. That's great! Now finish your burger! We started eating. Ella, being a kid, likes to play with her food. She would always remove the top bun and eat the meat patty first. This time she did the same, but as she took off the top bun, I heard her cry out in disgust. Ew, Dad! Dad, there's a toenail in my burger! What? My husband and I immediately looked at her patty, and what we saw almost made me throw up. There was indeed a filthy, bloody toenail sitting on top of the patty. We had been coming to McDonald's for ages, and never once had we faced a situation like this. I heard my husband screaming for the manager. Where's the manager? What kind of sick joke is this? Sir, what, what happened? The manager came rushing toward us. How come there's a bloody toenail in my daughter's burger? Are you guys insane? What kind of service is this? Hearing us finding a toenail in our food, all the other customers stopped eating and started to protest for their lack of attention. The manager called out to the chef working in the kitchen. Where's, where's the chef? Get him. I want to talk to him now. And that's when I received the shock of my life. The chef was none other than the same psycho man who I had slapped at the mall. He came limping to our table. His sick face had a huge grin, and I understood he saw us walking in here and decided to take revenge for my slap. But whose toenail was that? That's when my eyes noticed his left foot. I discovered why he was limping. He was bleeding from his big toe. There was no nail on it. The red flesh underneath was gushing out like an open wound. The man looked at me and then looked at Ella. Now do you see, little angel? That's blood. It's red in color. And it's my favorite color. <laughs> Ella started crying, and I was too horrified to speak. The manager called the cops, and he was arrested. I still remember when the cops were taking him away. He looked at me and waved. That was the last time I took my family to McDonald's. I don't care what anyone says. I will never be able to eat at McDonald's again. Hey guys, my name is Alan. As much as many hate me for saying it, I'm a paparazzi. I know, I know. We may not have the best reputation. We paparazzi are usually very intrusive and people don't like us. But even though it's an ugly job, someone has to do it. And as much as I hate to admit it, I love it. Not only did I consider myself a good paparazzi, but in my day, I could admit I was the best. No celebrity was safe from my camera. Just to get a good picture, I was able to get into the most hidden places and earn the hatred of everyone around me. I didn't work for any specific media. I went to show my photos and sold them to the highest bidder. But even though I was paid very well, it wasn't the money that mattered to me. It was the thrill. So, with that in mind, one day I decided to go for one of the biggest fish in the pond, Kim Kardashian. Despite being a very public person, all of us in the media know that she is very mysterious. There are times when all paparazzi know where she is, who she's with, and what she's doing. But at other times, she just disappears. Also, there's a great mystery with her choice of clothing. For some reason, she almost always wears black or veils. I searched the far reaches of the internet and there are many very logical theories, but in some pictures on Reddit I saw things that really caught my attention. Celebrities who wear black because they sold their souls to the devil, celebrities and strange sex, all that seemed nonsense, but nonsense that would bring a lot of attention if confirmed. Great job, kid! These pictures are great! Keep it up! Of course. It's always a pleasure to work with you. By the way, did you get my email I sent you regarding Kim? What? 
Were you serious about that? I know it seems weird, but celebrities are very eccentric. Imagine if it were true. Kid, I've been in the business a lot longer than you. Don't get in there. You'll never get those pictures because they're just internet hoaxes. None of it is real. Yeah, of course. That was Robert, the editor of a prestigious magazine. You would think that his refusal would demotivate me, but quite the opposite. At that moment, I knew I had to get those pictures. I started to dedicate all my time to following Kim. Night and day, I monitored where she was going, what she was doing, and how she was doing it. I thought it was going to be a months-long job, but surprisingly, I started noticing strange things in the first week. That day, she didn't have an event, but she got in the car dressed in black and wearing a veil. You couldn't see her face, but I knew it was her. As the hours passed, everything became even stranger. I followed the car and after a long drive, we ended up on the road to a forest. The girl's car was parked in an open, abandoned field. If I parked near her, it would be very obvious that I was following her, so I turned the car around and found a much more hidden place where I could see her. Come on, Kim, where are you? No one was getting out of their car. Seconds, minutes, and hours passed as nothing happened. Then, at one point, everything happened. Suddenly, many cars arrived, and many men in black robes surrounded the place. I got out of my car, closed the door, and walked a few meters to a place where I could take a good picture. The men made a bonfire in the center of the field and began to surround it. Then, Kim's car opened, and she got out with something in her hand. I zoomed in on whatever she was carrying and gave a little gasp when I realized that what she was holding was a dead chicken, which she threw into the middle of the campfire while everyone was dancing around it. I may not have been able to get a picture of her without the veil, but I had some pictures that no paparazzi would have ever dared to get in their lives. That was enough for me. I went back to the car to leave the place as soon as possible, but as I was getting in, something caught my attention. The door. The car door wasn't fully closed. It was just propped up. That was impossible. I'm a very methodical man. I always make sure to close the door when I get out of the car. I even remember closing it when I got out. How could it be open? Suddenly, I had a very bad feeling and I walked away from the car slowly, walking backward. Even though the windows were tinted, terror invaded me when, in the worst possible way, I confirmed my suspicions. Something inside the car was moving. Two shadows were moving from one place to the other, impatient, and the people in the car realized I had spotted them. I ran down the road away from the circus they had set up, but also away from the car. How far was the nearest town? 20 kilometers? 30 kilometers? It didn't matter. I had to get away as soon as possible. Suddenly, some lights came on behind me and a car was coming at high speed down the road. It was my car. I jumped out of the way into the middle of the road, dodging my own car, which had tried to run me over. Stop right now! I've got everything on camera! Far from being satisfied with the attempted homicide, the car turned around and tried to run me over again at full speed. This time, I didn't manage to dodge it in time, and it hit my leg. From the impact, I fell off the side of the road downhill into the woods. I tried to walk towards town, but in pain, I started to hear footsteps near me. I hid behind a tree and prayed that no one would find me. I didn't even dare to see whose footsteps they were. Maybe they were good people, maybe they were civilians, or maybe they were the ones who tried to run me over. I didn't want to find out. I just closed my eyes and cried. I started praying to myself that no one would find me. After a few minutes that seemed like hours, the footsteps were gone. I walked wounded to a village, and from there, I knew the nightmare was over. Kid, I can't use this! This is trash! What? This is ridiculous! That's Kim, I swear! Your oaf is useless to me, kid! Do you have pictures of her face? She was wearing a veil. Then these photos are useless! Hey, I almost died for those pictures! How dare you do that? You're a rookie, kid. I want you to leave and never come back! What? Security! 
and without another word, they threw me out of the place. I had copies of the photos. I took them to all the newspapers and magazines, and they all turned me down. Some didn't even open the door for me. It was as if they were waiting for me, as if they knew I was coming. After that day, they never accepted my pictures anywhere. They had made me the cross. Were all of these people involved in these rituals? I will never know. What was certain was that my career as a paparazzi was over. After that day, I had to give up all of my dreams of fame and settle for working in a bakery and taking pictures of landscapes. Call it karma or just bad luck, but even though I survived that day, my life was over. My name is Tomic McPherson. The story I'm about to tell you may seem incredible, but please, I need you to believe me, because I'm sure I won't survive tonight. It all started a few hours ago. My family and I were celebrating Thanksgiving, so we were all together, which is very rare in my family. Today, my aunt and uncle and my little cousin had come. It was also his birthday. They made such a long trip to get here. They don't deserve... Okay. Okay, keep it together, Tommy. You can do it. Just tell the story before it's too late. Even though it's been a few hours, all my memories are very blurry. It's like those bastards are doing something to confuse me, but if I try really hard, the memories come back. Although it's getting harder and harder. I'll do my best to tell you what happened. As I was saying, we were all gathered around the table. We had already eaten the turkey and now we were making jokes with my mom. We were telling her that she was taking too long to bring the cake for Jimmy, my cousin. She just laughed with the characteristic smile she had. It was as if her good humor was contagious throughout the whole house. She brought the cake, we turned off the lights and sang happy birthday to my cousin. But when we tried to turn them on, the first strange event happened. The lights just wouldn't turn on. My dad went to turn on the kitchen lights, but to no avail. My whole family was confused when suddenly the second event occurred. What the hell was that? It's just the cow, Bill. Relax. No, no. Bill's right. A cow doesn't make that noise unless something's happening to it. Do you think we should go check it out? Yeah, I'll get my shotgun. Oh no, we are a family at dinner. Don't do this. Gloria, I assure you I'll be back as soon as possible. We're just gonna check it out. Tommy, you coming with us? Me? Yeah, you. You're a man now. Come and help us see what's going on. Of course, Dad. The three of us walked to the barn at the back of the house. The path was short, but the darkness was absolute. It was as if a black void had swallowed everything outside our houses. When we arrived, a light source blinded us, and when my eyes cleared, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My dad covered my mouth, knowing that I was going to scream, but by his trembling hand, I knew that he was terrified too. That light was some kind of ship, and from it, two small beings were carrying a dead cow with some strange machinery. Oh shit, are those aliens? Shut it, Bill. They'll hear us. Oh my god, are they watching us? I turned my face back to the figures, and just as my uncle had said, the two faces were looking in our direction. At this, we ran desperately to the house. I heard some shots from the shotgun behind us, but I could think of nothing else but to cry. What had we seen? We arrived at the house, which was now full of candles, and my uncle in desperation began to tell us everything that had happened to our family, who were incredulous. Suddenly, my mother said some words that froze us all with shock. Where is my husband? My father was not in the house. What? Tommy, you saw him come in with us, didn't you? No, no, he was behind us. I think he kept shooting while we were running. Where is my husband? Without any of us being able to answer her, without me at least being able to react to my father's disappearance, my aunt let go of my little cousin and jumped at me, choking me with enormous force. My uncle and my mother jumped toward her and managed to free me. My aunt just stood there, staring blankly and her eyes dilated wide open. Her nose began to leak blood, and without a single word, she walked to the door and left. Mom? Mom! 
Where are you going? Oh, no, no, no. What are you doing? You're leaving us here alone? I'm sorry, Gloria. Please take care of my son. I'll go get her and I'll be back as soon as possible. Without letting my mother answer, he just left. Mom, I'm afraid he won't come back. Help me cover all the windows and doors. Don't cover the front door. Someone might come back, so just lock it. Yes, I started to cover all the windows with furniture, but while I was closing the kitchen door, I heard a knock on a dining room window. I approached slowly. My cousin was there too, but he didn't dare to see what it was. That window wasn't covered yet, but it was closed. That's why I left it for last. I stood next to the curtain, took courage, and opened it. My uncle was standing in front of the window, banging his head against the window with a blank stare. Ah! Dad! What's wrong? Where's that coming from? From the ceiling! Someone's trying to get in through the top! Mom, we have to hide! Mom? Son, you go hide. I feel a little dizzy. Aunt? What's the matter? You're white! Oh... You're smaller, Tommy. Did you do your homework at school? Aunt, it's Jimmy. Tommy's there. My mom was out of her mind, totally lost. The footsteps were getting closer and closer. I ran to the bathroom, and on the way in, I grabbed this camera and locked myself in. Ah! Jimmy, no! How could I have forgotten about him? I'm so dizzy. Why is it so hard for me to think? Those beings that invaded the house stood behind the bathroom door, and I saw how the handle began to open and close. If I hadn't locked the door, they would have already entered. They insisted a little more without much effort, and simply left. It's been a little over an hour since all this happened. I'm still locked in the bathroom. I know they're there. I hear the footsteps coming and going. I'm getting dizzier and dizzier. At times, I, I forget where I am and what I'm doing here. If anyone sees this footage, please look us up. My name is Tommy McPherson. I don't want to die. I'm so scared. Suddenly, I'm, I'm thirsty. Too thirsty. I need something to drink. Maybe if I pour myself a glass of water in the kitchen. Yes, that's it. Just a glass of water. And I'll be back. This video went viral a few years before on the internet. A few days later, that boy came out to clarify that it was all a joke. But some theories say that the one who manages his networks is his sister, trying to wash his image. And the boy actually lost his mind. This is a dramatization of the theories that point to that. My name is Mia. I'm not a well-known person or internet celebrity, nor do I care to be. But for the wrong reasons, my brother Bill is. You may have seen the video of a man walking into a fast food restaurant, ordering a popular Rick and Morty sauce, and yelling out that he is Pickle Rick. I'm Pickle Rick! Rick! I'm Pickle Rick! I'm Pickle Rick! Everyone laughed at him. But the story behind my brother's craziness is much more tragic than you think. It all started during the Rick and Morty hype, when the series was at its peak of popularity. My brother was one of the few people who didn't watch it, but I insisted so much that he finally gave in. Needless to say, he liked the series very much. 
he finished all the seasons in just one day. After finishing the series, he started watching it again, and the day my brother lost his mind, he was watching it a third time. That day, my parents had asked him if he could pick them up at McDonald's since they had gone to get something to eat together with our younger brother. Bill told them he had to fix the car and couldn't pick them up, but I know this was a lie because while he thought I was sleeping, I saw him go out to the supermarket. The reason he lied was that he wanted to stay home watching Rick and Morty for the third time, and although this bothered me a lot, I didn't say anything. The tragedy came a few hours later. The cab my parents decided to return with would never make it to our house. It crashed violently into a wall. Soon after, I learned that the driver was working under the influence of alcohol. I lost my parents and younger brother that day, but what I didn't know was that I had also lost Bill. My older brother's reaction caught me completely off guard. When he found out, he just stared, frozen without saying anything then went back to the dining room and watched Rick and Morty. He usually comments a lot on what he sees, but this time he just watched it quietly. When the season ended, he immediately replayed it from the beginning. After a while, he just slept, ate, and watched Rick and Morty. At first, I thought this was a normal reaction, but after a while, I started to worry. Bill, I'm going to work. Would you like to go out for a bite to eat when I get back? No. Are you sure? We can go out for Chinese food. I said no. Okay. Hey, don't blame yourself for what happened. There was no way you could have known something like this would happen by not looking for them. I don't blame myself for anything. It was the driver who was to blame. Oh. Okay. Good to know. You should just know that if you need to talk to someone, I'm here. There's nothing to talk about. How many times are we going to tell you? It was not my fault. There's nothing to talk about. Do you understand? Yeah, sorry. Out of nowhere, Bill smiled like a psycho and sat down to watch TV. He then burst out laughing. <laughs> I love this part. Bill, those are the credits. The episode ended. <laughs> oh. As much as I wanted to accompany my brother, someone had to work, but I had a bad feeling. This was my first day at work after what had happened with my family. Everyone came to my office to give me words of encouragement. But in the middle of the day, someone came into my office with a different motive. Sorry to butt in, Mia, but is this your brother? Oh God, this can't be good. Let me see. When I saw my partner's cell phone, I closed my eyes and almost started to cry. My brother was at the McDonald's where our parents had gone before the accident. Today, you all know what happened in that video, but at the time, I was shocked. Josh, when was this video uploaded? Oh, uh, hmm. Let me see. It was uploaded in about one hour, and it already has this many views? I looked at him a bit angrily. Oh, I'm sorry, Mia. It's okay. I have to talk to the boss and go home. That day, they let me go home early. On the way, I could only pray that Bill had come home. My prayers were answered, because when I got home, I heard my brother's screams. Hey! Morty! When I entered the house, the light from outside invaded the whole house, which was totally closed and dark. I tried to turn on the light, but it didn't work. Someone had cut the electricity supply. With some fear, I climbed the stairs to go to my brother's room, but when I got there, it was empty. I went back to look for him in the dining room, but when I reached the stairs, I gasped in fright. The door through which I had entered the house was not only closed, but someone had blocked it with a piece of furniture without making a sound. I was locked in. I approached the piece of furniture and started to push it a little at a time to move it, but suddenly, something pushed me with all its strength and threw me to the floor. When I looked up in the direction of my attacker, all I could see was a sharp object headed in the direction of my face. I dodged it, and as a knife stuck where my head used to be, I saw it go, with only a pair of underwear on, messy hair, and a demented look on his face. Wubba lubba dub dub! What? Bill, what are you doing? I quickly stood up and went upstairs to my room. 
I locked myself in and shut the door as tightly as I could. On the other side, there was silence. I put my ear to the door to see if I could hear anything, even the slightest sound to indicate that someone was on the other side. <coughs> With my scream, Bill rammed the door again and again. I was about to break. I had to find a place to hide quickly. I'm Pickle Rick! I'm Pickle Rick! I'm Pickle Rick! Lubba dubba dub dub! When the police arrived shortly after, he was locked up in a police station for attempted murder. I'm sure the psychologists were going to refer him to a mental institution, but before they could, he took his own life. My psychologist told me that Bill could never get over the guilt of the cab accident, that he was just a fragile young man who, in order not to have to face what happened to his family, locked himself inside Rick and Morty. He repressed so much that he simply collapsed and lost his sanity. As for me, I deal with the loss of my parents and siblings every day, whether it's going to therapy or remembering the good times with my family. I could never watch Rick and Morty again, but to clear my head, I started watching BoJack Horseman, and unlike my brother, I only watch a few episodes a day. I'm Jensen. And three months ago, I made the biggest mistake of my life. I went to a friend's sleepover party where everyone watched videos about the famous elevator game. Though the night ended with fun and jokes, the weird game ritual stuck in my mind longer than it should have. So, once I came home, I was dying to try it out. We live in an old 13-stored building. Our apartment was on the ground floor. There weren't many residents in our building, so I had the perfect opportunity to conduct the elevator game ritual without being disturbed by any other tenants. It was a quiet Sunday night. My dad passed out on the couch after heavy drinking, and my mom was at her friend's house. Making the most of the situation, I tiptoed outside and came to the lobby. Heavy rain and blowing wind were making the lobby windows tremble from time to time. I grabbed my phone and walked to the elevator at the end of the corridor. I pressed the button and the elevator door slid open, making the usual ring. Should I do this? Oh, man, can't believe I'm doing this. I entered the elevator and closed the door. I won't be explaining the ritual in detail because it works. And I don't want anyone else to make the same mistake I made. Just for some context, let me tell you that after pressing a certain number in a particular order, the final floor you're supposed to get on is the fifth, and from there, people say a woman enters the elevator with you. So I did as I heard. I pressed the number of floors for the elevator, started going to each floor, and opened to a view of a dimly lit empty lobby. When it was time to reach the fifth floor, I chickened out in fear. Thinking there was still time to stop and back out from this ominous game, I pressed the stop button, and the elevator stopped between floors three and four. I heard my breathing going faster. Damn it! I regretted being so stupid and pressed the ground floor button to go back to my room. The elevator started going down, and I felt a little relieved that somehow I managed to break the chain. But little did I know, when the number plate reached the ground floor, the elevator stopped with a sudden jerk. What the? 
At first, I thought the elevator went out of order because of my experiment. So I went to press the alarm in panic. But then, the door suddenly opened. And they opened to a dark, hollow space. I kid you not. Outside the elevator, there was nothing but pitch black darkness. I immediately pressed the door closing button, but it didn't work. Drops of sweat gathered on my forehead. What have I done? What is this place? Am I in some other dimension? I screamed. Hello? Anybody out there? But I only heard my voice reverberate. Suddenly, a few lights flickered, and one by one the lights turned on, revealing an unknown floor which looked more like an office back room. There were yellow walls and a soggy wet floor. A reeking smell of dampness and rotten filled my lungs. Am I to the basement? This must be the basement. I've never been to the basement of our building, though. The elevator was obviously out of order, so I decided to look for the stairs. I stepped out of the elevator, which was my mistake number two. I started walking through the pale yellow back room. It was empty. There wasn't even a single piece of furniture, not even a dustbin or a mop around, just vast, empty space. With every step I took ahead, I turned back to see how small and distant the elevator was getting from me. After walking like this for God knows how many minutes, I suddenly saw this woman. She was sitting on the floor, blocking my way. Her back faced me so I couldn't see her face. Her body was trembling, and a creepy whimpering sound was taking place. She was crying. <laughs> um, ma'am? Excuse me? Thinking she didn't hear me, I called out a little louder this time. Ma'am? Are you alright? Her crying stopped. I am... I am sorry. What? Why? Please, forgive me. I started feeling creeped out. What are you saying? I've never met you before. Why are you apologizing? I'm sorry for wanting to have your blood all over me. Wh what? I felt my stomach drop. My voice started to die down in my heart. The woman slowly got up without turning around. And then the lights went out. What the... The entire place turned pitch black again. <laughs> what's... what's happening? And just then, the lights were back on. But one thing was different. Now, the woman was arching behind, staring at me from upside down. Her hands didn't touch the floor, though, because she had no hands. Yes... She only had the upper torso followed by her skinny legs. She wore a white midi dress with stains on it. I can't explain how horrifying her body looked in that position. She started laughing hysterically while being arched like that. <laughs> I'm sorry for what I'm about to do to you. And then she started running towards me at full speed while being arched at the back. Ah! <laughs> Here I come! She was chasing me down like a distorted hop frog. I ran while gagging and panting for breath. All I wanted was to find the elevator and slam inside it. I could hear her stomping footsteps echoing with her harrowing laughter. I feared to look back because stumbling at that moment would have been worst. The lights began flickering and heavy winds started blowing inside that closed place. All the yellow world started dripping black, thick liquid. Even the ceilings above my head were licking, too. I felt like I will drown in this hell and will never be able to get out. The woman's laughter got closer to me with each second. My legs were about to give up. I was just running from one end to the other end of the back room, as if I was in a maze. I thought I will never get out of this infinite space. Claustrophobia started to settle in, and just then, 
I heard the elevator ding. Finally, I found it. Standing at the other end, the elevator was my only chance to live. But the doors now have started to close. I could see them coming close to each other, and my chance for surviving, for escaping this hell started narrowing down each second. The woman screamed from behind. You can't escape. It's about time. <laughs> but I gathered all of my courage, all of my strength. I screamed to myself. You can do this, Jensen. You're not going to die in this time loop. Run! Run faster! I never ran this fastest in my entire life. By an inch, my body passed the closing doors and I got in. I stumbled and fell inside the elevator out of reflex, and the doors closed behind me. I don't remember what happened after that. Two days later, when I woke up in my bed, I saw my mom and dad sitting near me with worried faces. I came to know that my dad heard my scream from my room and went to check in, but he didn't find me there. So we came out to the lobby, and that's when the elevator door opened on our floor. He was shocked and surprised to see me lying unconscious inside the elevator. He still had no idea how he could hear my scream when I was not even in the apartment. After a terrible fever, when I finally got onto my feet, my parents asked me what exactly happened to me that night. I told them I got stuck while riding the elevator for fun and panicked once it started malfunctioning. I never told them about this woman in the back room space where I mistook to be our apartment basement. I'm Claire. Before I begin my story, I want to tell you all that Ouija boards are probably the easiest way to contact the dead. And I beg everyone to please, please never play with a Ouija board. When I was 17, a junior in high school, a friend of mine named Alice told me that she had a Ouija board, which she got as a joke from a country fair. She claimed that it always worked when she played it with her other friends. So one day, we decided to have a sleepover at her place, just to try it out for fun. Being into the paranormal and having almost no paranormal experiences behind my belt, I was pretty damn excited. Apart from me and Alice, her 15-year-old sister, Reagan, also joined us that night, which wasn't the plan, though. Alice's parents were out to attend some dinner party, so it was just the three of us in the big house. After finishing dinner, we sat down in Alice's room, Alice placed the Ouija board in the middle, and just then, the power cut happened. It gave me goosebumps. What are the odds? I hope this isn't a prank, Alice. Reagan got up and looked outside the window. Seems like only our house doesn't have electricity. That's weird. I'll light the candles. We have to wait for Dad to come home so he can fix this. Okay, I'll help you. Alice and Reagan lit up candles around the room and placed one to get a clear view of the Ouija board. We placed our fingers on the wooden heart-shaped cursor, and Alice asked the first question. Is there any spirit with us right now? Without wasting a single second, the cursor moved to yes. I panicked. I didn't move the cursor. And from what I could tell, Alice and Reagan's fingers were barely on it. The cursor seemed to come alive and move literally on its own. My eyes widened in fear, but Alice calmed me down, saying, It's okay. Ask the questions. What is your name? The cursor moved to J-O-H-N. Ah! All of a sudden, Reagan screamed, and her hands began to shake. Fear turned her face completely pale. And before we could understand what happened, she grabbed my arm tightly and brought her face extremely close to mine. Her eyes were all white, and she began whispering gibberish in a freakish way while staring at me. Get off me! Get off me! I screamed and somehow freed myself from Reagan's tight grasp. She put her claw-like hands on the floor, and her face became distorted, like she was trying her best to fight something inside her. Her demeanor changed drastically. She began growling like some wild animal, 
and was taking deep breaths, heavy with aggression. Uh, 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 uh. Regan, what's happening to you? Please, do something! Regan started rocking back and forth, sitting on the floor, and continued making distorted noises. It was straight out of some horror movie. Alice realized the situation was getting out of hand. Hold my hand! Now! I am calling out to John. John, you must leave us. Goodbye! Say it with me, Claire. Goodbye, John! Goodbye, John! We both began screaming goodbye to the spirit. I noticed that Reagan was somehow calming down. Her breathing got normal, and then she fainted on the floor. The power came back right at that moment, and the candles blew out on their own, as if someone extinguished them on their way out. Once the light hit the room, we discovered that Reagan had wet herself. Alice and I sprinkled cold water on her face and somehow woke her up. After waking up, she didn't say a single word and went straight to the washroom. I knocked on the bathroom door repeatedly. I was worried if Reagan felt all right. Alice asked, Reagan, are you okay? Come on, let us in. But she didn't open the door for half an hour straight. When she came out, we were shocked to see her face. She had bruises all over her face as if she was beaten up badly. Her eyes were blood red like she hadn't slept for weeks. Oh my God. I'm going to bed. That's the only sentence that came out of her mouth that night. Alice and I couldn't ask her any further questions. The next morning, we went to her room and found her standing outside the window, staring at the streets. Reagan, how, how are you feeling now? Fine, she replied without turning her face towards us. Um, I've been meaning to ask you, do you know any John? That's when she turned back at us in one swift motion. Her eyes were wide. A slow, eerie grin appeared on her face. <laughs> what? Say something! What she did next still scares me too much to sleep. She sat down on the floor like a four-legged animal and sniffed the air like a dog. I better take a shower. I still smell like piss and then crawled to the bathroom like a baby. That was the last time I went to Alice's house. A few days later, I heard Reagan was suffering from a high fever. Her body was filled with red rashes and her tongue turned black. Alice skipped school for weeks as her family got more worried about Reagan's worsening situation. A month after the Ouija board incident, we were sitting in our class when the principal informed us that Reagan Miller had taken her own life by hanging herself in the house cellar. All the students and school authorities attended Reagan's funeral at our local church. I was standing beside a group of teenagers when I overheard their conversation. Isn't it creepy that Reagan killed herself the same way John did? As soon as I heard the name John, I knew I had to talk to them. So I approached them and asked, who's John? What they told me still scares me from sleep. John used to be a 30-year-old man who worked in the school cafeteria. He liked Reagan, and one time even tried to flirt with her. But Reagan threatened him that if he ever came near her, she would report him to the principal. Three days after that, John hung himself in his cellar. I still can't wrap my head around this spooky incident. Was it really some dead person's soul that possessed Reagan to make her take her own life? Or was it Reagan's troubled mind that secretly blamed herself for John's death and decided to put an end to her grieving conscience? What do you think? A young fan by the name of Kaylee had posted this shocking photo on Twitter after a friend had dared her. Kaylee revealed that the conversation went like this. Kaylee said to her friend, BTS are so beautiful I could shove a hammer in my mouth. Her friend called her out on her bluff, and she was willing to prove them wrong. 
The story you're about to see is loosely based on this crazy fan who went too far with her obsession over BTS. For entertainment purposes, IMR has added a fictional spin-off to the story for their fans. Enjoy. There's a saying that too much of anything isn't good. I can assure you whoever said it ain't kidding. I'm Jackson. I go to Mulberry High. My best friend Noah is a funny guy, and accidentally his cousin Hannah is my girlfriend. So their sibling rivalry is always going on, be it at their house or at school. Noah always comes up with new pranks and ideas to piss Hannah off. Just the basic sibling stuff, which never caused anyone harm. But one thing I resented about my girlfriend was her extreme obsession with Bangton boys, or commonly identified as BTS. Hannah is a huge K-pop fan and her favorite band is BTS. She loves the Korean boy band to such an extent that sometimes I feel insecure that if she ever met them, she will certainly dump me. Anyways, so this one time we were chilling at the school cafeteria. Everyone was cracking jokes and talking like usual. Only Hannah was watching some BTS interviews. She was so into the video that instead of the water, she picked up the ketchup and poured it inside her mouth without taking her eyes off the video. She realized her mistake once the extreme tangy and sauciness hit her tongue, and she began coughing like crazy. Her eyes went bloodshot, and her veins in the forehead popped up, turning her face blue. Holy smokes, Hannah! Water. Hannah, are you alright? Water! <coughs> We gave her water, but the ketchup caught up in her throat, making it so dry that she puked on her plate. Everyone moved away from the table in disgust, and Hannah felt extremely embarrassed. I gave her some water, which she finished in one gulp, and then looked around. Everyone was staring at her for causing the scene. I didn't realize it was ketchup. Damn, Hannah, how careless can you be? Someone needs to cut off your internet connection so you can't watch any more BTS. What? As soon as Noah said it, I saw Hannah's face turning red in anger. You suck, Noah. Saying this, she stormed out of the cafeteria. I followed her for obvious reasons, and the entire day kept her away from Noah. For the moment, things mellowed down, but I realized her love for BTS was reaching a pretty disturbing level. A few days later, we were sitting in our biology class when our principal walked in with a new girl. The girl looked shy and nervous. What I noticed about her first was her t-shirt. She had a picture of all the BTS members on it. Noah saw that too, and he said in a low voice to Hannah, Looks like you got some competition, dear sister. Shut up, Noah. She warned him, but I noticed her face turning unhappy the moment she saw the new girl. So this new girl introduced herself as Betsy and joined our class that day. Even though she seemed reserved at first glance, gradually she opened up. One day, I was walking past our chemistry lab when I saw Noah kissing the new girl. Even though Noah didn't see me, Betsy noticed me staring at them. The way she stared kind of creeped me out, and I immediately walked away. After the lunch break, we met up behind the school area to smoke, and Noah brought Betsy with him. Hannah and I weren't expecting her, so things got a bit awkward. Hannah looked at Betsy and asked, Did someone give you that BTS t-shirt, or are you a fan too? I ain't a fan. I worship them. Even though Hannah asked her in a casual tone, she replied in an intimidating way. Then you must be knowing everything about them, huh? Yes, every single thing about them. Really? Do you know what Jungkook wanted to do before he joined BTS? Um, uh, no. Do you? He wanted to be a tattoo artist. Seems like you're not as crazy about them as I am. <laughs> Hannah laughed, venturing her victorious chuckle, and Betsy went all pissed off, losing the battle even before it began. Realizing the tension between these two, Noah said funnily, Uh, uh seems like you two girls are bonding. Just because you did some trivia doesn't mean you're a bigger fan than I am. True fandom means how far you're willing to go for your idol. And I can beat anyone on that front. I don't think so. Anna lit up her cigarette and suddenly Betsy snatched the lighter from her hand and did something unthinkable. Can you do this for BTS? 
She turned on the lighter and held the flame on her tongue. We all gasped in horror as smoke came out of her burning tongue, yet she didn't even flinch. Her skin started to burn and we all looked at her with frightful eyes. Noah threw the lighter away and screamed. Oh my god, are you crazy? <laughs> Tell that to your sister. She's the one who wanted to challenge me. Hannah was stunned to speak, and I too had no words. Betsy walked away, and Noah followed her while lecturing her about how dangerous it was, what she just did. Hannah didn't speak the entire way. I couldn't tell what made her more upset. The scary stunt that Betsy pulled off, or the fact that she proved that she could go to any extent for BTS way more than Hannah. That night, we had a party to attend. One of our seniors was throwing it in his farmhouse. At first, Hannah didn't want to go, but once Noah told her Betsy will be there, she agreed right away. I knew at that very moment, something bad was going to happen tonight. We reached the party and I tried my best to keep Hannah away from Betsy, but they eventually came face to face. Hannah chugged off her third beer and said, I'm a bigger fan than you, you witch. Let's have a contest then. Fine. We were standing in the backyard where in one corner there was a toolbox. Betsy walked to it and took out a hammer from the box. Betsy, what are you going to do? I can fit this hammer in my mouth and prove to you that I am the biggest fan of BTS. No way. You're a freak, Betsy. What? What did you call me? Betsy opened her mouth and tried shoving the hammer inside, but even after three to four tries, she couldn't. Anna laughed at her and called her a freak again. Not being able to take this insult, Betsy suddenly picked up a screwdriver from the box and started slitting the corners of her mouth to make her jaw open wide. Everyone at the party began screaming at this horrible sight. The sound of flesh cutting along with her painful cry still echoes in my ears. Once she got done with this violent act, she wiped her bloody mouth with her handkerchief and shoved the hammer right inside. She started chuckling like that while the hammer remained in her slitted mouth. I wouldn't have been scared if I had seen a ghost, but this particular memory still makes my skin crawl. Hannah screamed in horror and collapsed to the ground. We called the paramedics and Betsy was taken to the hospital. Noah went to see her in the hospital, but her parents didn't let him go near her. I don't know why Betsy's parents think it was our fault and they took her away once she got discharged. I still believe that wasn't the first time this girl harmed herself to prove her point. Why would she come to our school in the middle of the term? I already told you. Why won't you believe me? You want me to think that thing you saw broke my stuff, Carol? Who else could have done it? Who else? Do you think I'm stupid? That night, my boyfriend had found his sports jersey collection destroyed. It looked as if something had scratched them. I swear I saw it, Craig. The night before, while I was waiting for Craig to arrive while I did the laundry, I saw a tall, thin figure walking down the alley through the window. You're the only person who's been here all day! Don't lie! It was that thing! I'm tired of your shit! <sighs> I'm leaving! Craig just grabbed his wallet and car keys, but that was more than enough, so he immediately headed towards the front door. That's when I tried to stop him. No! Don't go! Please, don't go away! I need you! He looked at me with resentful eyes and shook his arm. Get away! When my boyfriend closed the door behind him, and I heard how he unlocked the car, I started crying. You can't! You can't do this to me! I'm not sure how long I stayed like that, but I stopped as soon as I noticed. The sound of the car engine running could still be heard. <gasps> Craig! I quickly opened the door and walked a few steps. As I had deduced, the car was still there. His lights were on, and the driver's door was open. Craig? I felt as if my heart stopped when I saw him there, lying on the ground. I had no idea what happened to him. Was he dead or just unconscious? I wanted to get closer, but I was paralyzed with fear. Mm -hmm. oh. How 
help? Please! Is anyone there? <laughs> Craig screams, and the sound of banging woke me up. When I opened my eyes, the first thing I saw was him hitting the transparent wall that divided us. <clears throat> Craig? He had on a metallic thing that was covering his eyes. Carol? Of course. You obviously had to be here. W what is this, huh? What's going on? I started to examine the place we were in after hearing my boyfriend's questions. The building seemed old. Its walls and floors were very dirty and full of destroyed things, but the one that was separating us was new, as were the lights. There, at the end of the hall, was a door on both my side and his. Are you listening to me? I asked, what the fuck is this all about? Why do I have this on? Why would I know? It's never your fault, is it? Everything is always so convenient, but somehow it never has to do with you, Carol. I didn't do anything. You know what? Let's just get out of here. What do you see? There are two doors, one on my side and the other on yours. Then see what you can do! Soon, I got up and started walking towards my door. Getting closer, I noticed a key on the table. There's a key here, but it doesn't work. It didn't take me long to notice the hole in the wall. There was also a key in the other hallway. Craig! Craig! Come here! I'm sure we should exchange the keys. Did you forget I can't see? You have to guide me! Little by little, my boyfriend got closer with the help of my instructions. In the wall, right next to you, there's a hole. Give me the key and... Let me try first. He put his hand on the door to find the lock. Of course, the key didn't work. <sighs> Fine. Once we exchanged keys, we opened both doors, revealing what I least expected. Oh my god! Before I could tell my boyfriend what was on the other side, a voice came over the speakers. Hello, Carol. Hello, Craig. What the fuck? This is a game for the two of you. As you may have noticed, you are separated by a wall that has holes in different areas. In Carol's hallway, there is nothing. But in Craig's, there are knives on the walls and two keys. The first will open the doors that are next to both hallways and the device that covers Craig's eyes. While the second will open the doors that are at the end of both corridors. So, you have two options. Run away together, or one of you dies. The countdown has just begun. You have three minutes. What? What is this shit, Carol? I told you, I don't know. I'll guide you, okay? You just, you have to trust me. Ugh, I can do this myself! My boyfriend started walking down the hallway full of knives. Of course, he tried to locate them with the help of his hands, but the place was too narrow. Ah, shit! Oh, it's too sharp! A few drops of blood soon fell to the floor. The cut on my boyfriend's hand was long, but not deep. Let me help you! Just hurry up! Without wasting any more time, I began to guide Craig. Mm. Uh. This time, the knives cut his right leg. Try not to wobble. It's too narrow. You don't have to... Ouch! There was a cut on his arm. Each time, the trail of blood became more noticeable. Listen to me. You... Oh, shut up! You're not helping at all! Suddenly, he started running. Uh, uh. I could see how the pieces of his skin were left on the knives. Craig! Did I make it? You're in the middle. In the middle? In the blink of an eye, he began to touch things around him. First the door and then the table with the key. When he found it, he removed what was covering his eyes and dropped it to the ground. Then he approached the door. Craig, what are you doing? Shut up, shut up, shut the fuck up! I am sick of you! I'm not gonna stay here with you another minute! My heart started beating faster due to fear. Don't leave me here! Please, I, I promise everything will be different. I'll change, I need you! But he didn't listen to my pleas. He just opened the door and walked out. As soon as he did, the doors at the end of both halls also opened. That's when I saw it. It was that long, skinny thing again. This time, I could see more clearly its claws and the jigsaw mask it was wearing. 
Of course, I started to cry as it got closer, even though it was on the other side of the wall. The hallway wasn't narrow enough for that thing, so it didn't hurt itself one bit walking past the knives. The moment that monster was right in front of me, I tried to speak despite the huge lump in my throat. Please, I tried. I said one of you was going to die. I tried. The one who didn't do things the way he should have. The thing raised its hand to me and started scratching at the wall. <laughs> Finally, it managed to break it. I had no idea what it was going to do, but I expected the worst. Instead, what it did was remove its jigsaw mask, revealing a disfigured and grime-covered face with small eyes and large, sharp fangs. I need to eat. <sighs> the meat tastes better when they think they have escaped. Suddenly, the monster turned, dropped to all fours, and started running outside right the way Craig had escaped. I had barely managed to get close to the door frame when I heard him. <coughs> the monster tore off large chunks of skin with each bite. I was surprised to notice Craig kept fighting, even though it had eaten his arms. The pool of blood on the floor was huge. At some point, Craig finally stopped moving, and when only his torso and head remained, the monster walked away. So I approached. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. That's what you deserve for being a shitty boyfriend. If you hadn't started thinking I was manipulating you, none of this would have happened. Stupid, useless piece of meat. Without hesitation, I kicked what was left of him and walked in search of someone who could help me. Who doesn't like surprises? Like a birthday party or... A gift that has been carefully chosen for you even though you didn't know it. I bet it feels pretty good to find out, doesn't it? But what about something bad? You would be absolutely terrified. Just a few months ago, I moved to another city so I could attend the university I wanted. Since then, I had been very busy, so I didn't get a chance to see my closest friends. Luckily, Eliza, Catherine, Justin, and I managed to get together on a Sunday afternoon. What can I say? We had a great time. In fact, we had so much fun together that I felt as if time had passed too quickly. Since when I checked my watch, it was already 7 p.m. I should go now, guys. Aw, come on, Donald. Yeah, man, stay a bit longer. Tomorrow is Monday, Justin. You can always skip class, right? You know I can't. Okay, send me a message when you get home. Yeah, please. After I said goodbye to my friends, I left the bar we were in and started walking towards the apartment I now live in. Even though the building was on the outskirts of town, it wasn't too far, so I didn't mind walking. I wasn't thinking of anything specific as I headed towards the place. My mind went from one memory to another and from one concern to another repeatedly. I was just distracted. Suddenly, I felt as if everything started to spin. I was so dizzy that my brain just couldn't keep control of my body, so I fell to the ground. I was able to realize that someone grabbed my arm and started dragging me into the woods. Oh, what? When I opened my eyes, the first thing I felt was intense pain in the back of my head. Shit! My vision was still blurry and it was dark, but I still tried to look around the place. It was a small room with what seemed to be a few odd pieces of furniture. I could tell there was a door nearby, but no windows were in sight. As soon as I tried to move, I realized that both my feet and hands were tied to the chair I was sitting on. What the heck? Help! Somebody help! The room fell silent after my screams, until I started to hear a reoccurring sound near me. Huh? It sounded as if... Hello, Donald. Did you shit your pants? Son of a bitch. What do you want from me? Are you going to try to take my organs out so you can have money to live your miserable life? What if that's what I want, Donald? What the fuck are you going to do about it? He had already mentioned my name twice, but I was so nervous that I didn't realize it until the second time. 
<laughs> Who are you? Do you like my mask? <laughs> Is this funny to you? Creep! I bet you think you're a lot better than me right now. Don't you, Donald? Uh, I'm not perfect, but at least I'm not a fucking kidnapper. And yet you deserve to be torn from this world. I was so confused, flustered, and angry that I didn't even know what to answer him as it seemed as if nothing he said made any sense. Say hi to apartment 44, Donald. Douglas? I knew exactly who he was. When I moved into my apartment, everyone used to call me Douglas. It seemed like the neighbor couldn't really tell any difference between the two of us. Oh, Donald, I know your twin brother. Stop messing with us. <laughs> the thing is, I didn't have a brother, much less a twin. I want to say, nice to meet you, Donald. I have known who you are for a long time. But you, you have been there believing that you are better than me and can replace me. You didn't think I'd let you do that, did you? Look... You're crazy if you think I want to replace you, man. I don't even know you. You just don't get it, do you? He stood right in front of me, grabbed the mask with his right hand, and took it off. What the fuck? The face in front of me was similar to mine. It was almost as if I was seeing myself in a mirror, but I couldn't confirm it due to the darkness. Without realizing it, I stared at him in silence. Oh, let me help you. The man walked somewhere behind me, and seconds later, the place was so lit up that I had to close my eyes. Shit! When I opened them, he was there again, in front of me. Why the hell do you look so much like me? This time, I was able to notice certain differences, such as the psycho's expression I had never seen on my face, as well as his horrible condition since it seemed as if he hadn't slept in days. But the rest was too similar. <laughs> ah, the expression on your face. <laughs> That's how I imagined mine was the first time I saw you. I felt silent once more. I was terrified like you are now. But then I understood. Someone or something cloned us. The government, maybe. I don't know. That's not what really matters. <laughs> We're alike. It, it's something that can happen, you know? But I can't let it be. It's driving me crazy. There can't be two because the other... The other won't be able to live in peace. <laughs> the other? The other. The one who is less noticed. The one who is not the best. But I will be. I just have to get that skin off you. The man soon took out a knife from the right pocket of his pants. It was then that I began to shake desperately in an attempt to free myself. You're only going to make things worse for yourself. <laughs> ah! 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 The moment he started cutting me, I couldn't stop screaming. Stop! Before I passed out, I heard him say, Fuck, this ain't gonna work with this knife. The next time I regained consciousness, I was alone, slowly bleeding to death. Apparently, he wanted to cut me with another weapon, so he delayed my death by putting a bandage on me. I can't imagine what would have happened if my friends hadn't reported me missing to the police, who were able to find me before Douglas continued. Soon I will have to attend the trial that will land him in jail but I don't think I can bear to see his face. That face that is like mine, but perfect without any scars. Back in 2010, when Despicable Me came out, my parents took me and my older sister to see the movie. Even though I was only five years old at the time, I can still remember my excitement when I saw those funny, cute, yellow little creatures, the Minions. Since then, I became a huge fan of them. I had toys, posters, overalls, and I even always wore yellow. Of course, I was the happiest girl in the world when, five years later, 
the movie Minions was released. Mom! Mom! Yes, Angela? By then, my dad had died a few years ago, so it was my mom's responsibility to pay for everything we needed. I didn't notice, but she worked nonstop. Don't you know? A Minions movie is coming out. Really? Yes, I'd like to go see it. We'll go later, little one. You always say the same thing. My mom looked up from her computer so she could look at me. I'm so sorry, my sweet Angela. I try, but I'm always busy. I know. My mother stared at me for a few seconds until she smiled. I'll tell Sarah to go with you, okay? Sarah! My sister Sarah was 15 years old at the time. It really seemed like she didn't want to go see that movie with me, but she ended up agreeing after making a deal with mom. Bye, mom. Have fun, girls. We will, mommy. Sarah and I hailed a cab as soon as we could since mom had insisted, and in no time we made it to the nearest cinema in town. There were movie posters outside, among which was one of the ones I wanted to see. Minions! I ran toward it to observe it in more detail. It didn't take long for me to turn to my sister. See you, Sarah? There, next to Sarah, was Alexa, her best friend. I soon walked toward them, who didn't even look at me until I spoke. Hi, Alexa. Are you going to see Minions with us? It'll be so much fun. My sister immediately looked at me with annoyance, but Alexa started laughing. (laughs) <laughs> Do you think we're really going to watch that movie with you? You are too innocent. <laughs> but that's why we came here, isn't it, Sarah? We came here because you want to see that movie, Angela, but I don't. So we'll go eat while you watch it. Alone? Yes, alone. Let's go. She took me by the wrist, and then the three of us went into the cinema and lined up to buy my ticket. I couldn't help but stare at who was in front of us. It was a very tall man who was wearing black clothes. I couldn't take a look at his face, but just seeing his figure was making me nervous. Sarah, what do you want now? Why won't you watch the movie with me? I thought that was obvious, Angela. (laughs) It's a fucking children's movie. We're not kids anymore. Why can't you understand? But... And I'm sick of the minions. Your creepy obsession is fucking exhausting. It's not an obsession. I just like them a lot. Please don't use bad words. Or what? You'll tell mom? I... No, you won't. You won't tell her this or that you watch the movie alone. Now go on over there while we buy your ticket. I did what she told me. I got out of line and went to sit on a bench while I looked at the floor without thinking about what had happened. Hello, girl. I raised my head to see the man once I heard him, but I didn't answer. It was him, the person who was in front of us in line. You like minions, don't you? You're dressed just like one. The man seemed familiar to me. It was when he mentioned my outfit that I realized. And you look like Gru. (laughs) That's right. But I think you won't appear in this movie. Maybe yes, maybe no. You seem like a good girl, so I'm going to give you a present. Take it. He handed me a ticket to go see the movie. Aren't you going to see it? I already did. Angela! After the man left, my sister approached. You're not going to believe it! Gru gave me a ticket! I held it out to her to show it, but she just snatched it away from me. Hey! Great, this will make everything easier. I'll go in with you and then I'll leave, understand? Yeah. Minutes after she left me alone in the cinema, the movie started. I forgot everything else while watching it. Of course, I was very happy and had a lot of fun, but everything changed as soon as it finished. Sarah had told me where she and Alexa would be. I knew that I should just go look for them, but being alone made me very nervous. Everything got worse as soon as I got out and noticed that it was already dark. Why did you have to do this, Sarah? I started to walk toward the restaurant where they would be, when in the alley next to the cinema, I noticed something. Three strange silhouettes. One was very tall, while the others huge were lying on the ground. (sighs) The tall person was hitting one of the other two. Suddenly, the lights of a passing car gave me a better look for a moment. The two things on the ground were yellow. Minions? The tall person stopped and slowly turned to me. I could only see their eyes in the darkness. They deserve it. They have 
what they deserve. <laughs> this is what you deserve too, little one. I didn't move as I was frozen in fear. But the man didn't approach me. He just ran in the opposite direction. <sighs> Even though I was scared, I slowly walked toward the minions. Uh, hello? They didn't even move. I, I want to help. Finally, I reached one of them. Hey. <coughs> I tried to move back to get away, but it didn't take long for the minion to grab one of my ankles, bringing me down. <coughs> the huge minion continued to approach me. Since he couldn't walk for some reason, he was crawling on the ground with the help of his arms. When he was within inches of me again, he began to push off with my knees. Stop it! His massive body was crushing my legs more and more as he got closer to my face. For some reason, I could feel how warm drops fell from his mouth onto my overalls. I assumed it was saliva. It hurts! Stop! I fell silent the moment I had his giant mouth and fangs right in front of my face. Only our breathing could be heard. Help me! A car passed close to me again. That's when I saw her for a few seconds. Inside the minion costume was Sarah. Her jaw was as open and destroyed as the minion's. That day, after a person heard me and came to help, they called my mom and took Sarah and Alexa to the hospital by ambulance, as they were both in the same horrible condition. The two died shortly after, as they couldn't survive the torture that man had done to them. I work in a McDonald's drive through and often come across crazy customers. I generally work the day shift. So this one Tuesday afternoon, there weren't many customers. The scorching heat made it tough to roam around the streets. I was watching some videos on YouTube when I noticed a car pulling up at the side of the road. At first, I thought someone is going to get out of the car, but no one did. The car just waited. After a few seconds, the car engine again started, and now it drove to the drive through window. Once the car came close to the window, I saw a freaky-looking man sitting in the driver's seat. He had stringy black hair, which was probably a wig, and wore a Michael Jackson costume. His entire face was painted white to resemble MJ's iconic face. He had sunglasses on. Even though he looked the same as MJ, he had a rough spiky beard and very bad hygiene. I could smell his goat-like body odor even from all that distance. He took off his sunglasses and smirked at me creepily, then said, imitating MJ's voice, Hello, are you open? Um, yes, uh, yes, of course. Welcome to McDonald's. What can I get you? I will have a kid's meal. I am sorry? A kid's meal. Do you serve that? Yes, we do, sir, but... <laughs> Call me Michael. I was grossed out by this man, and now that he was asking for a kid's meal, heightened that feeling to another level. But in the end, I am here to deliver whatever the customers order, so I said in an awkward voice, Oh... Okay, Michael, uh, anything else with your kid's meal? That's when he turned to the back seat, and for the first time, I noticed this little girl sitting behind him. She looked terrified and barely moved. The man smiled at her and said, Would you like anything more, honey? The girl shook her head from left to right, gesturing no. And then, the man began screaming at her. How many times do I have to tell you that when I ask you a question, you answer it by speaking? I want my mommy. The girl started crying, and I realized something is wrong there. Seeing the girl cry, the man quickly mellowed himself down and started consoling her in a calm but creepy voice. Don't cry. You know how much daddy loves you. Mommy never loved you, honey. Now stop crying. Daddy is going to take you to Disneyland, and we're going to have so much fun together. All right? Okay. He now looked at me and said, We are done with the show, mister. Get us our food. Is everything all right, sir? Is that your daughter? I'm telling you, for the final time, call me Michael. And whether she's my daughter or not, that's none of your business, you stupid McDonald's guy. I understood if I pissed him off or interrogated him about this girl, 
he would drive away and I would never be able to save that poor child if she required my help. So I began to tread carefully. Yes, you are right, Michael. It's none of my business. I apologize for my unprofessional behavior. Kindly wait. I'll get your food. Good. Thank you. Saying this, he turned to the little girl and said, You see, honey, people listen to daddy when he screams. So it's not daddy's fault. You have to raise your voice to get through this world. There's nothing bad in that. I moved away from the window so that I could call 911. I threw some chicken McNuggets in the deep fryer so that the man would think I was busy cooking. I heard him singing Billy Jean in his obnoxious, creepy voice. <laughs> Billy Jean is not my lover. She's just the girl who claims that I am the one. But the kid is not my son. Ah, no, no. She says I am the one. Thee, but the kid is not my son. Na, 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 it was a perfect opportunity. The man had no idea that I was calling the cops on him. He went on singing, and I explained the situation to the operator. Yes, I think he has kidnapped her. Do you see any weapons on him? No, not yet. Please, send the cops. The little girl is in danger. No! I quickly turned back and saw the crazy Michael had half his body inside the drive through window. He was holding the knife, and the little girl was sobbing uncontrollably. I told you it was none of your business. Why did you call the cops? Can't anyone be trusted these days? <laughs> no, no, no. Saying this, he pulled the rest of his body in and lunged at me. My phone fell on the floor, but I was still connected to the 911 call. The man's eyes were bloodshot. He looked like a Michael Jackson from hell. He grabbed my throat with one hand and was all set to cut me open with the sharp, shiny knife. Please, stop. You, you, don't, you don't have to do this. Now you will know what happens when you interfere in people's business. Die, moron. <laughs> he tried to stab me, but I blocked him with my arm and the knife made a deep cut. I screamed in pain and realized he is soon to make a second attempt and I don't have much time. I grabbed his filthy, stringy hair and punched him in the nose without giving him a second chance to contemplate this attack. He let go of me, holding his bleeding nose, and the knife fell from his hand. I quickly grabbed it before him and warned him. If you take one more step, I swear I will chop you like a pig. Fine, fine. Don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. A few minutes later, the cops came and arrested the creep. The little girl was taken to the police station, where her mother picked her up. It was found out that the crazy MJ guy was indeed the girl's father. He was mentally damaged and obsessed with Michael Jackson. His wife divorced him and wanted to cut all ties with him because of his weird behavior. But the man decided to abduct his daughter and run away as far as possible. I am happy that I saved the girl's life. But it also makes me sad that the poor kid will have to live with such horrifying memories of her psycho dad for the rest of her life. In the world of entertainment, there have been many different rumors and theories. A lot of them have been dismissed, others have been confirmed, and about some, nothing has been said. Among these, a small part of those are too weird, crazy, and creepy to be true. But how can we be so sure they aren't? In the K-pop industry, there's something much more important than talent or skills. Appearance. That's a fundamental part of South Korean culture, after all. You can notice it in groups like BTS, whose members look perfect down to the smallest detail. Everyone knows it's made up of seven guys, right? But there are those who claim that there was an eighth member. I'm not talking about Kim Ji-hoon, since he was eventually rejected, which means there was someone else who made it. Back in 2012, after BTS was formed and before their debut, an eighth member was chosen. His stage name was Di Yul, and he was just as perfect and talented as everyone else. Back then, I was working at Big Hit Music, so I was aware of all that stuff. I know it all started one night. When I was leaving the agency to go home, I saw someone at the entrance, being held back by the security guards. They rejected me! They rejected me! Why did they do it? 
They owe me an explanation. He was a tall, pale man with black hair, all common features in South Korea. The problem was, was his face. It was really creepy as if it looked like it had been disfigured in some way. I couldn't help but feel a chill when I saw him. The security guards were holding him back as best they could, but he kept moving and trying to get further into the building. At a certain point, he stopped and stared at me. You! What are you looking at? Come and help me! I'm owed an explanation! I approached, but not to speak to him, but to finally leave. Hey! Don't ignore me! Help me! Don't you know who I am? I'm the eighth member of BTS! I froze once I heard him. Yeah, sure, man. I'm sorry to break your illusions, but an eighth member has already been chosen, and he doesn't look anything like you. You don't get it! I'm the most appropriate candidate! I am a prodigy! No one else could match my skills! I deserve- I'm sorry, but as far as I know, they don't want another member, and they won't change the one they already chose. I advise you go home and forget about this. They owe me an explanation! I want to know why I wasn't chosen! I need a good reason! Trust me, there is one. This whole situation seemed absurd to me. I wondered if that man hadn't looked at himself in the mirror as he thought about why he was rejected. He had to be crazy. Anyway, weeks later, during a normal work day, I went up the elevator and got off at the floor where my office was. As usual, I started to work, but something stopped me. I began to hear voices that seemed to be arguing, but I couldn't understand what they were saying as the walls were soundproof. Still. I was worried because it wasn't a common situation. As I left my office, I stared down the hallway. Suddenly, some security guards bumped into me as they ran to get to one of the rooms. Concerned, I watched as they entered the office of one of the company representatives. Get him out of here! I have no idea how he got in! Don't touch me! I'm not done! It was that man again. You're a coward! Useless! How can you turn me down and not even have a reason to? We don't have to give you an explanation. I didn't hesitate to slowly approach. If you don't have a good reason, I deserve to be a part of BTS way more than fucking D. Yule! Get him out of- It's because of your appearance. He stood still and turned to look at me after I spoke. I want to hear it from his mouth! It's true. Beauty standards. Your face is unacceptable to represent BTS. I thought it was obvious. It happened in the military service. I was doing my duty. Isn't that honorable? Not here. Get him out. This time, when the security guards tried to move him, he didn't put up any resistance. The moment the man walked past me, he smiled in the creepiest way I've ever seen in my entire life. After that incident, the weeks passed and the year ended but the man didn't show up again. One day, hours after dark, I started packing everything up to go home. On that occasion, the elevator was broken, so I used the stairs. It was when I got to the second floor that I noticed the door open and I started to hear some noises. Almost everyone was supposed to be gone by that time, so I went to see what was going on in case someone needed help. I started walking down the hall trying to identify where the sound was coming from the second room on the right. Just before I reached the door, the noises stopped. Slowly, I opened the door, went in, and turned on the light. I didn't even have time to look around, as I soon passed out. When I woke up, the first thing I saw was an unconscious D. Yule in front of me on the other side of the room. I started to tremble as soon as I noticed the cuts he had all over his face and body. Do you like what I did? I haven't finished yet. I felt as if my heart stopped beating for an instant, but I still turned my head to the left. There was that man again. Oh, come on, don't make that face. I did what I had to do. <laughs> you guys wanted a perfect eighth member, right? I guess you won't have him anymore. It's not his fault, it's yours. You should have changed. You should have had plastic surgery and... <laughs> you all live in a lie. Even if my face was acceptable, you would want more. You are so selfish. 
Have you thought about your children? How they'll feel about being so ugly compared to their parents? It's all a fucking selfish lie that doesn't really solve anything. The man got up and started walking towards the eighth member. Wait! I will show everyone. Everyone! <laughs> I will never forget what I saw and what I heard. The man took a knife and began to make more cuts on D. Yule's face, but this time much deeper. <laughs> At some point, D. Yule stopped struggling, and I knew he was dead. You'll pay for this. I know. Suddenly, I watched as he grabbed the knife and cut his own throat. Ah! I don't know exactly when it was, but they found us. Then they took the two bodies away and never spoke about what happened again. But I still think of D. Yule when I watch the music video for I Need You, where the other members burn his possessions. For as long as I can remember, I've always been the kind of person who has something to tell. Some say I have bad luck, others say it's good luck, but the truth is that I always venture into anything that can be different and interesting, as dangerous as it may be. I'm proud of this, and everyone finds it interesting, but once, in the least expected place and time, that curiosity almost cost me my life. Are you sure you don't want me to go and cook something, Sophie? The streets in the wee hours of the morning are a bit dangerous. It would be dangerous for you too if you came over, macho man. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll just go to McDonald's. I've been craving a burger since I woke up. I know you can handle yourself, but you can stop me from worrying. Really, don't worry. I promise to let you know as soon as I get back, okay? Hungry, I headed for the nearest McDonald's to my house, only about 10 blocks away. The place was open all night, and ignoring my boyfriend's warning, I parked the car and went inside. Hey, what are you doing here at this hour, Sophie? Hey, Alan. The usual. I got hungry and didn't want to cook for myself. <laughs> Chris must be terrified. Yeah, but that's how it is. <laughs> After waiting a few minutes, I grabbed my food, said goodbye to my friend, and walked back to my car. As I was getting in, something caught my attention. In front of me, there was another car parked, but the engine was running, and inside, someone was staring. Although there was light in the parking lot of the restaurant, his car was dark. It was as if inside that car, there was an emptiness that devoured all the natural light that could enter. The only thing I could see were those terrifying eyes, staring at me, as if inside that car was a wild animal ready to devour me. Nope. Without thinking twice, I got into my car and locked myself in. I was about to start the engine and leave, but a loud noise made me look at the car in front of me again. I opened the window, and with curiosity, I kept looking. The eyes were gone, but the source of the noise was still inside the car, banging it from the inside. What is happening? Is there some kind of animal trapped in the car? As if in answer to my question, the car door opened and silence reigned for a few seconds as its member got out. Leaning out of the back of the car, a huge man began to look around, confused and angry. The silence did not last long because without warning, the man shouted with all his strength toward the sky. <coughs> Alan, do you hear that? I think you should call someone from security. A man is screaming like crazy outside. <laughs> Chris is gonna freak out when he sees this. <laughs> Before I could react, he jumped on the roof of his car and, still looking at me, screamed violently in my direction. I tried to start the engine, but the car wouldn't start. Meanwhile, the man jumped out of the car and came running in my direction like a rabid animal. Because of the distance, he didn't run for more than two seconds, but it felt like an eternity. I managed to start the car and accelerate it as hard as I could. As I drove off, I heard a bang on my car, but he didn't do more than that. I had escaped. I left him behind. 
terrified. I arrived home, and without getting out of the car, I breathed a sigh of relief. I opened the window to get some air while I picked up my cell phone. I felt like my head was going to explode. That was possibly the tensest moment of my life. I went into my chat with Alan and saw that I received a voice message, so I played it. Sophie, where are you going? Don't get out of the car. A guard saw you while you were leaving. The man is not here. He's on top of you. The man who had chased me before, the one I had filmed laughing so much, was walking toward me. I was helpless. I could only crawl backward in fear, staring at him as he prepared to attack me. Suddenly, as if by a miracle, a car parked in front of us. And from it, three young men jumped out at the man who was stalking me. Dude, what is your problem? Leave the girl alone! With brutal and unmeasured force, the man simply threw the young man who came to my aid. The other two stood in front of him and tried to stop him, but neither of them could do anything against him. He just swatted them away like flies. The man was alone again, in front of me, looking at me with his demonic eyes, ready to do who knows what to me. But I wasn't going to let him do anything. Like every time I went out at night, I was prepared. And thanks to the time those guys held him, I was able to come to my senses and pull the gun. I ran to my house and locked myself in. The young men got in their car and drove away. One of them had his cell phone in his hand, probably calling the police. Meanwhile, as if nothing had happened to him, the man got up and came running to my door, kicking and punching it with all the anger he could muster. Just as I felt he was about to knock it down, the police arrived, and between two cops, they were able to stop him in time. But they were never able to find out who the man was or what he was doing. I later found out that he was committed to a psychiatric hospital, and he would probably never get out of there. The car he was in was not his, but neither could they find out who it belonged to. Me? Let's just say I still go out to eat at night, but whenever I see someone behaving strangely, I put my cell phone away and make it up as fast as I can. Who was not afraid of the dark during their childhood? I've heard it's because of the anxiety of not knowing what's there. But in my case, I knew exactly what was in the darkness, which haunts me to this day. When I was a child, for a long time I was the youngest in my whole family, since my parents had me being a little older than usual. So I grew up playing alone between teenagers and adults, which made me a shy, reserved, and lonely girl. Kathy! Yes, Mommy? Now that the holidays started, Grandma's invited us to her house and... Granny Rita loved having family gatherings at her house in the countryside whenever possible. Sweetie, what's wrong? I don't want to go. Why not? I don't like going to Grandma's house. It's scary. My mom walked up to me and put her hand on my shoulder, trying to comfort me. Don't worry, my little girl. Everything will be as it always is. During the following nights before the family reunion, I remember having nightmares all the time. I would wake up hyperventilating with my body full of sweat. But I never tried to go to my parents' room as I was too scared to get out of bed. Kathy, Kathy! M Mom, are you okay? You were screaming. I don't know. I don't remember. <sighs> you have to get ready. We're going to Grandma's house today, remember? Yes, Mom. I did my best, even though I was feeling awful. I was too tired, and the lump in my throat didn't seem to go away. By the time I got in the car, I had to stop myself from starting to cry. My father, who was driving, looked at me through the rearview mirror for a few seconds. Are you okay, little one? I don't want to go. Is this about the monster? The monster? Last time, Kathy was really scared of a monster. There are no monsters in Grandma's house, honey. Yes, there are. I've heard them and- I already told you there are wild animals in the forest. But you don't have to be afraid. They won't do anything to you. But- 
Daddy. Don't worry. I'll take care of you, okay? I promise. Okay. It took us over an hour to reach our destination. My grandmother Rita's house was very big, enough to have space for the whole family for a few nights. When I got out of the car, and once I was in front of it, a bad feeling started to make me nauseous. Without thinking, I ran toward my mom and hugged her tightly. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Kathy. My dad pulled me away from her by holding my hand. I told you I'll take care of you. Calm down. We can't leave. Grandma will be very sad if she doesn't get to see her favorite granddaughter, don't you think? In response, I just nodded. He and I walked together to the porch of the house where my mom rang the doorbell. It didn't take long for Grandma to come out and greet us. Kathy, my sweet little girl. For the next few hours, I played with my toys by myself and even helped my grandmother bake some desserts. I was doing whatever it took to not think about the monster. When night fell, the house was already filled with basically the whole family. I'm sure Jeff and Bruce... My grandmother was talking to one of my aunts, but I interrupted her. Can I have coffee, Granny? Of course not, my sweet Kathy. It's not good for your young body. Quickly, she walked to the kitchen and brought me juice and some cookies. Have this instead. Sadly, I grabbed those things and went to sit at the table while doing my best not to fall asleep. Kathy, what are you doing sleeping here? I'll, I'll take you to a bedroom. No, the monster. I'll leave the light on, okay? So the monster won't get close. My dad turned on the lamp. I lay down on the bed. He didn't take long to cover me with the blanket and give me a kiss on the forehead. Everything will be fine. Monsters only appear in the dark. Once my dad left the room and closed the door, I stared at the ceiling. I remember thinking he was right. The monster had never appeared during the day. So I relaxed and slowly began to close my eyes. But all of a sudden, everything went dark. No! Dad! Dad! The monster! Dad! I began to look from one side of the room to the other, trembling as I waited for my dad or mom to arrive. At one point, I heard a creak. It was the door opening slowly. Dad? I stared at the space between the door and the outside, looking for a sign that it was him. But instead of what I expected, red eyes suddenly appeared. They were glowing in the midst of the darkness. There wasn't much I could tell due to the lack of light, but I knew it was the monster. <laughs> Please, go away. Instead of leaving, I clearly heard his footsteps as he entered the room. I didn't think the situation could get any worse until the door creaked again, and I saw another pair of glowing eyes. At that point, my breathing started to get so loud that I had to cover my mouth with one hand while pulling the blanket over myself with the other. It never worked, but there was nothing else I could do. From one moment to another, I felt a strong blow on the bed. Ah! One of the two monsters had dug its claws near my foot. He was very close to me. Stop! For an instant, all was silent. I thought it was over when I heard him again. What are you trying to do, pathetic girl? As the monster spoke, its voice was getting further away from me. <gasps> I want to hear you cry. <laughs> it's like food to me. <sighs> the other monster kept digging its claws into the bed. <laughs> In fact, he did that so many times that he tore up the blanket. In the blink of an eye, what was left of the blanket had fallen to the floor. That's when I saw it. One of them, the biggest, was right next to me, with an expression as if he was extremely hungry and desperate. My crying seemed to truly be like food for him, but I couldn't even make a sound as I was frozen like a statue. If you don't cry, 
We'll have to hurt you. <laughs> I started crying as soon as I felt the other one, the tallest moving its sharp claws on my foot. Please. I saw their bodies as dark as a shadow, covered in fur and scales before closing my eyes. But as suddenly as they had gone out, the lights came on. I stopped breathing for a moment when it hit me. They had the faces of my cousins, Jeff and Bruce. Finding out what those monsters really were wasn't much better, since I realized that in reality, there is something worse than creatures with claws and fangs. Sick people who feed on the suffering of others. That's why, since then, there is nothing that haunts me more than the memory of the psychopathic expressions of my cousins. Say his name and he comes again. He will punish the bad children. Hear his footsteps on the snowy night. He is Krampus. He is fright. My sister was reciting this poem again and again. I got so irritated after a point that I threw the TV remote aiming at her head, screaming. Stop it! Ow! You hurt me, Andrew. And stop singing that creepy rhyme! Why? Are you scared? You know, Krampus will come for you. You hitting me for no reason makes you a bad kid this Christmas. The moment Susie said it, our living room light flickered. My face turned pale. He gave an eerie smile and whispered. Told you, he's coming. Shut up! I screamed and went to my room. The windows near my bed opened towards the deep woods. We lived in this small house on the outskirts. Our parents are farmers and they were at the stable feeding our horses. So it was only me and my sister in the house. The stable is right behind, but I still feared that if Krampus comes for me, my mom might not be able to hear my scream. That's when I heard a glass break. Susie? I called out to her, but no reply came. I came out of my room and found Susie lying on the floor. Susie? Why are you lying on the floor? As I went closer to check on her, I discovered a horrific scene. Someone had snatched Susie's eyes. Her eye sockets were hollow. Ah! A low growl took place right behind me. Turning around, I saw the most terrifying creature. His skin was a pale, icy-looking blue. His beard was like Santa's, except it was black and came to a point. His nose was long, and his face looked grizzled, but more human than I thought. His horns looked like they'd touch the ceiling if he jumped. His body looked human in shape, but the animal in appearance. His legs were twisted and ended in hooves, like that of a cow or a bull. He had a long tail, his torso was contorted, and everything but his face and palms were covered in fur. He had broken chains around his wrists and what looked like a heavy red Christmas ornament attached to his tail by another chain. His ears were pointed and so were his yellow teeth. Despite his horrid outlandish appearance, the most noticeable thing about the creature were the bells that it wore and the basket on its back that had a partial arm of a child peeking from it. The stories were true and so is Krampus. What? What happened to Susie? <laughs> I punished her for searing you. But but she wasn't a bad kid. I, I was. She said, you'll come for me. <laughs> She's mistaken the rules. Didn't she try to scare you in the first place? Yeah, she did, but... Krampus didn't wait for my answer and started heading towards the main door. With his every step, I could feel our house tremble as if an earthquake had arrived. I tried to scream with all my might, but no sound would escape my mouth as I finally was able to choke out. Mom! Dad! Krampus turned back at me again. There's no point in trying to save them. I'm gonna punish them next! Please, don't, don't do this to my family. You call them family? 
Did you forget the time your drunk dad burned your hand with a cigarette? Tears rolled down my eyes. Even though he was right, I still wanted my family, no matter how cruel and mean they were to me. Adopted kids do not always get the childhood they want. I haven't, but I don't want to be alone again. You need to stop saving me every time. Please, for once, let me have a family. But they never treat you right. Family is supposed to love you. Stop asking Santa for a fake family. He keeps granting your wishes, and I am the one who has to take care of the consequences afterwards. You are no ordinary kid. You don't need a family. But I want a normal life. Krampus whipped his chain on the floor in anger, screaming, Move out of my way! The times were repeating themselves. I followed Krampus as he stormed towards the farmhouse. I begged, but he didn't stop, just like the last time. He went inside the horse stable and slammed the wooden doors behind him, locking me outside. What happened next was no more a shock to me. I began hearing Krampus growl, followed by the rattling of his metal whip, and the screams of my mom and dad echoed in the valley. Susie's poem kept repeating in my mind. Say his name and he comes again. He will punish the bad children. Hear his footsteps on the snowy night. He is Krampus. He is fright. Sister Darlin asked me to step outside the office for a moment as she had something private to discuss with Mr. and Mrs. Harlow. Even though I walked out, I still stood by the door to overhear their conversation. Andrew is a very good kid, but he had been through a lot. The two previous families were abusive towards him. We found bruises and burnt wounds on his body that his previous adoptive parents caused him. But what is even more terrifying is their deaths. Their deaths? What are you saying? Both the families died before Thanksgiving at the hand of some psycho killer. At least, that's what the cops are saying. If you want to provide him with a home, I suggest you take good care of that kid. Like I said, he has been through a lot. It must have been awful to be abused by people who promised to take care of him and then witness their deaths. Did he ever talk about the killer? Or at least what happened on those nights? No. In both cases, the cops found him unconscious in his room. The investigation is still ongoing, so I want you to take special care of him. Of course we will, Sister Darlin. We will give Andrew the life he deserves. Don't worry, he will have the best Thanksgiving of his life with us this time. Have you ever been contacted by a loved one after a long time? Surely, yes. In the age of telecommunications, this is very normal. Now I will ask you another question. Was the person who contacted you dead? The day that letter came to me, I was checking my letters. They were the same letters as always. The water bill, the electric bill, sales promotions, etc. But among all the letters, a white envelope caught my attention. When I opened it, I almost cried. It was a letter from my boyfriend James, asking me to meet him at the cabin where he died in that tragic accident. James was very fanatical about Jigsaw, to the point where it could be considered an obsession. The day he died, he went to his parents' cabin with me and some friends to emulate a non-dangerous version of his favorite movie. But things went wrong. James's sister jokingly shot him with one of the guns that were supposed to be empty, but my boyfriend had forgotten to remove the bullet inside the gun. James died on the spot. Driven by the melancholy that it had been a year since his death, and the curiosity of knowing that it was his handwriting, I went to the cabin, which was now abandoned and in a terrible state. I opened the door and entered very cautiously, but before I could react, a person appeared behind me and put a handkerchief on my face. I tried to defend myself, but sleep took over, and confused, I fainted. When I opened my eyes, I felt a huge pain seize my neck. A cold bar encircled my head. Ahead of me was a mirror to which I looked straight ahead and gave a dry scream. 
Just like in Jigsaw, I had a reverse bear trap on my head. Next to the mirror was a Jigsaw toy sitting on a chair, and from it, a voice started to come out. Hello, Maria. I want to play a game. is death, and although you have managed to rebuild your life, he has not rested in peace. His spirit still wanders the walls of this very house, mourning his death, begging for his killer to join him. (laughs) But it wouldn't be fair to just kill you, would it? No, James would like it that way. One last game. That game he couldn't fulfill a year ago, but even more real. That would be the best way to atone for your sins. To give your soul more peace of mind, or let it rot along with James. What was it talking about? I hadn't murdered James. Hadn't the maniac who caught me been told the real story? It was his sister who pulled the trigger, not me. I'll explain the rules of the game to you, little Maria. As you have noticed, you have a reverse bear trap on your head. Rest assured, the key is not inside your eye, but you will find it in one of the boxes distributed in the house. There are five boxes, but only one has the right key. You will have to move fast and choose well, because if you don't find it in time, this trap will kill you. Oh, and one more thing. If you find a woman with a pig's head looking for you, I recommend you avoid her. That will be me. And if I see you, well, the game won't end in the best way for you. A light came on in the trap and began to flicker, making a sound intermittently. I came out of the room and saw the cabin. It was on the second floor. I ran to look for the boxes, and when I found the first one in the next room, I put my hands through the hole in it and started looking for the key. As I reached in, I felt a horrible pain through my fingers. That box was full of needles. Filled with blood, I used my right hand to grab what looked like a key and put it in my trap. The key was the wrong one. I left the room and went downstairs. There was another box in the center of the room. I was about to go to it, but I heard footsteps walking nearby. It was a woman with a pig's head on her body. For some reason, the alarm in my head went off. I figured it sure didn't work when she was around to make the game fairer. I hid behind the couch and listened as each step of her huge boots rang across the hardwood floor in the room. I watched out of the corner of my eye as she walked up the stairs and noticed how from her right hand a huge pointy knife was sticking out, which she surely planned to use on me. I waited for her to leave, and when my trap started working again, I checked the box full of needles. When I took out the key and tested it, I discovered that it didn't work either. I started walking toward the kitchen, but something blocked my path. The couch I was hiding in flew in my direction, hitting me and knocking me to the floor. I looked to see who had thrown it at me, but to my surprise, there was no one there. I ran in the direction of the kitchen. I had to look for the key, but coming down the stairs and alerted by the noise, the woman saw me. I reached in, quickly, but she lunged at me with her sharp knife and cut off my arm. I rammed her, and she crashed into the kitchen table, and I saw her mask come off. When I saw her face, I was shocked. It was Laura, James's sister. (laughs) You got me, friend. (laughs) Why are you so confused? I know you killed him. (laughs) You know, Maria, from that day on, I felt so guilty. I woke up every day thinking that I had murdered my brother until he appeared in front of me. James started to come to my dreams. Do you know what he told me? That you murdered him and that I had to avenge him. Oh no, don't give me that face. If James doesn't exist, who threw that couch? Who wrote that damn letter? Because you know what? It wasn't me. She had a point. Enough explanation. You don't even deserve it. You know, I'm done playing nice. Now, you can die. Laura ran towards me, 
and before she could stick me with her huge knife, I locked her arm and we both struggled. She had more strength than me, so as soon as I let go of her arm, the knife went through my face, leaving a mark. I pushed her away and reached into the needles. Even though the trap wasn't making a sound, surely the internal timer was still working. Laura lunged at me again, and in a distraction I had, I pulled out one of the needles and stuck it in her face. Ah! In an impulse of rage, I grabbed her head and put it in the needle box, using my other hand to stick as many needles in her as I could. After a few seconds of resistance, Laura simply gave in to the pain and stopped moving. She had died. Meanwhile, I grabbed the key, put it in my trap, and it came loose. It was the right key. <sighs> Eat shit, Laura. Wounded, I went to the exit door. And when I got there, I saw Laura standing behind me next to James, staring at me. Well, James, now you have company. I'll wait for you next year so I can kill another one of your relatives. <laughs> After making fun of my dead boyfriend, I just walked away. Laura may have been crazy, but she got one thing right. I did kill James. I provoked her into shooting him with that gun, and James didn't forget to take the bullet out of the gun. I put the bullet back. The bastard was cheating on me. And you know what? I couldn't just leave him. I wanted revenge. To be honest, knowing he was still furious even after his death filled my heart with joy. At least now I know that his poor soul will continue to suffer for eternity, begging for revenge that will never come. I was a stalker once. Yeah, you heard it right. I stalked a girl in my school named Miley. She had a very pretty face and lovable smile. I wanted to tell her how much I liked her, but never got the chance. Honestly, I wasn't that popular in school. I was that one kid who was barely noticed by girls, especially beautiful girls. And Miley was a goddess. Her blonde, shiny hair, her pink lips, everything made me go crazy. I never missed Spanish class as Miley sat in front of me. While everyone paid attention to the teacher, I paid attention to her gorgeous hair. I've lost count of how many times I need forward just to smell her hair. She used green apple shampoo, which smelt like heaven to me. But stalking someone has its own perks. The chances of getting caught are always high. So this one time I was sniffing her hair and suddenly a sneeze came and I sneezed on her shoulders, spraying things that I don't want to mention. <coughs> Ew, Jesus, what the hell, Trevor? I I'm, s I'm sorry, Miley, I, I, I did- You're disgusting, man. The students started laughing, and Miley stormed out of the class to go to the washroom. After that day, the minimum chances of ever getting close to a girl like her died, no doubt. But still, I couldn't get over her. I would secretly follow her after school on her way home. Sometimes I even climbed to a tall tree on the opposite sidewalk of her house so I could watch her changing clothes in her room. Yes, I admit I was disgusting, but there was something in me that kept pushing me to want her, to crave for her like a drowning man craves for air. It was close to prom and I was standing in the hallway staring at Miley laughing with her sidekicks when our football captain Bob asked her to be his date. I thought she would say yes because, after all, he was popular. But, to my surprise, she refused. Bob got pissed and said, What? You're rejecting me? Me? Yes, Bob. But why? Because I think you have a stupid name. <laughs> You're such a witch, dumb blonde. Bob insulted her and left. Well, he didn't get away with it, though. No one ever heard from him after that day. I choked him next morning when he went for a run through the hiking trails. I tied stones with his neck and threw him into the lake so that no one ever finds his body. And lucky me, no one ever did. That day, I realized that I'm capable to ruin anyone who will attempt to hurt Miley. And this is how I started hating Kim Kardashian. Let me tell you, Miley got obsessed with her unreal beauty standards. 
She was so adamant to turn herself into Kim that she did horrible things to herself. She started eating lots and lots of chocolates to put on weight just to get her behind shape like Kim. Her craziness didn't stop right there. She even injected vegetable oil into her lips just to get them plump like Kim Kardashian. The results obviously weren't how she expected them to be. Slowly, her lips began to swell, and her cheeks started rotting with the chemical reaction of the oil. One afternoon, we were having lunch in the cafeteria when Miley began screaming while eating. Ah! As we turned to look at her, we saw a horrible scene. Maggots were popping out of her swollen lips. She was screaming in terrible pain. The principal called the paramedics who took her to the hospital. Her parents were informed too. The doctors told them her entire jaw needs to be removed or else she would die of skin cancer. My sweet, innocent Miley lost her face. That day, I decided to finish the person who hurt her the most. Call me a maniac, but I don't care. I began stalking Kim Kardashian. I had an uncle who stayed in Paris, and I went to see him with my mother one time. Call it my luck and Kim's bad luck. I came to know Kim was supposed to go up there with her husband Kanye West. I didn't want to let this opportunity go. I woke up in the morning dressed like a man in the crowd and waited near the destination they were supposed to arrive at. There was already media people and fans waiting for her, so it became easy to hide amongst them. Just when I saw the car coming, I braced myself. She ruined my beautiful Emily. I will get my revenge. As her car stopped right in the middle of the road, I came to her side of the window. First, her husband got down, and then she did. The moment she did, I went to teach her a lesson, but the thick crowd started shoving each other. I could only grab her feet, and then she began screaming. Her bodyguard intervened, and I fell on the ground. People started kicking me like I was some vermin. I got beaten up really bad and somehow managed to escape the crowd, pulling my miserable self up. When I came home, my mom and my uncle were shocked to see me with all the injuries. They asked me what had happened, and for the first time, I told someone about Miley. I told them how much I loved her, and some woman with unreal beauty manipulated her to be someone she's not. I remember crying myself to sleep that night. We came back home, and my mom went to see Miley. I never expected that she would tell her about what I tried to do, but it came out she did. I was sitting on the porch one evening when I saw Miley walk in from our gate. Her face was changed, but she was still beautiful to me. Seeing her, I stood up with a confused face. She came towards me and I saw her watery eyes. Are you crazy, Trevor? I have always been. For you... I spoke. She broke into tears and I took her into my arms. It's been three years now and we're married. I'm not angry at Kim anymore, just so you know. That's why I decided to share my story. I was wrong stalking Miley and I was wrong in trying to hurt Kim, but I'm happy everything ended in my favor. Call me crazy, but deep down I kind of feel thankful to Kim. Because of her, I got the love of my life to acknowledge and see my infinite love for her. I admit it makes her look different with her jaw being missing, but she will always be the most beautiful woman to me. And now, she's mine forever.